The man known to history as King Henry VI was born on the 6th of December 1421 during the time of the Hundred Years' War. His mother, Catherine of Valois, was born in Paris on the 27th of October 1401 to King Charles VI of France and Isabeau of Bavaria. She was their youngest daughter and sister of Charles VII. She would marry Henry VI's father, King Henry V, at 18 years old on the 2nd of June 1420, but little of her early years are known as a younger princess. Henry V was crowned king on the 9th of April 1413, but at the time of his birth on the 16th of September 1386, he was not in the direct line of succession. In 1399, his father, Henry Bolingbroke, cousin of King Richard II, seized the throne, becoming Henry IV, the first Lancastrian king. As a result, Henry V came to be in the line of succession and was given the title Prince of Wales. His military career began at an early age and would continue throughout his life, culminating in the invasion of France in 1415 and the Battle of Agincourt, which broke the truce negotiated by Richard II to press his claim to the French throne through his descent from Edward III and reignited the Hundred Years' War. This French campaign would conclude in 1420 with the Treaty of Troyes, in which King Charles VI acknowledged Henry as heir to the French throne. Henry's war in France would continue, now allied with the Burgundians against the Armagnacs. He returned to England early in 1421, where he progressed around the country and would be joined in March by Catherine following her coronation. After receiving news of his brother Thomas's death in March at Beauget, Henry returned to France in June 1421. Several battles followed, including that which was to be his last at the Siege of Meaux. He would die from dysentery three months following the conclusion of the siege at the Castle of Vincennes on the 31st of August 1422, having never met his son. As the only son of Henry V, the nine-month-old Henry became King Henry VI upon his father's death. However, as an infant, clearly there was no way that Henry could rule. Close to death, Henry V had made provisions in his will for the protection and upbringing of his son. Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, Henry's youngest brother, who had earlier in 1422 been designated as Keeper of the Realm, was accorded with the protection and defence of the young prince. But governorship of the boy was to go to the Duke of Exeter, Thomas Beaufort, while the Regency of France would pass to John, Duke of Bedford, Henry's eldest younger brother, until such time as the young Henry was old enough to rule. However, there would be bad feeling over some of the provisions in the will, namely that Humphrey was not seen as a good choice for Regent of England. Instead, despite his arguments for himself which continued throughout his life, he was appointed by Parliament to defend the realm and hold the position of Chief Counselor to the King, but without the powers of a Regent. As the youngest of the two surviving brothers, these powers would be given up to John whenever he was present in England. A council would be formed until such time as the king came into his majority. Among those who would sit on this council was Henry Beaufort, Bishop of Winchester. Shortly after the death of his father, Charles VI of France died and by virtue of the Treaty of Troyes, Henry now succeeded to the throne of France at still less than a year old. However, this was not accepted throughout the whole of France, as Dauphin Charles's claim to the throne was acknowledged by the Armagnacs, who still held sway in central and southern France. The Dauphin, although disinherited by the Treaty of Troyes, was proclaimed Charles VII on the 30th of October, 1422. As was usual, Catherine, although involved in her son's upbringing and choice of servants, was not his principal carer. He was placed under the control of Elizabeth Ryman and cared for by a small team of nurses before being given over to the care of a new governess, Lady Alice Butler. She was to begin his teaching in courtesy, discipline and other appropriate matters 
and was given provision to provide reasonable chastisement without reprisals to the young king when necessary. Henry would make his first appearance in public life shortly before his second birthday at the opening of Parliament. This long-held tradition of the monarch being present for the opening of Parliament is still upheld today, although in a somewhat modernized form. In June 1428, Richard Beecham, the Earl of Warwick, was appointed as Henry's guardian to continue his education in matters of kingship, piety, and martial arts. Records remain of two little coat armors made for him at seven years old, and that he was given a long-bladed sword for to learn the king to play in his tender age. That such was the efficacy of his education by Lady Alice already at this time, that in March 1428, his ruling council estimated that he would be able to take a more active hand in governance in just a few years. However, this statement also alludes to the friction within the council caused by Gloucester's continual seeking of power and offered a form of resistance to him. During this first decade of Henry's life, the war in France against the Armagnacs continued under his uncle, John, Duke of Bedford. In August 1424, Bedford and his English and Norman forces assembled on the Verneuil Plain in Normandy heavily outnumbered by the combined force of the French and Scots, who were allied to the Armagnacs at this time. The initial assault by the Lombard cavalry broke through the English lines, but after a hard-fought battle, Bedford's forces prevailed, marking the high point of the English campaign. It is estimated that almost half of the assembled French force died on the field that day. The battles continued to push back the Armagnacs, and in late 1428, the Siege of Orléans began. However, their earlier success would not be repeated. Thomas Montacute, Earl of Salisbury, who'd been present by Bedford's side in France for many years, was killed early on during the siege, and despite being replaced by a competent commander, the English couldn't storm the heavily fortified city. The appearance of Joan of Arc first in the court of Charles VII in February 1429 and then at Orléans in April would signal their upcoming defeat. Joan and her retinue entered the town easily despite the English blockade, and after only four days of fighting, the English lifted the siege and retreated on the 8th of May. Further battles would follow where Joan was present, with many English supporting towns capitulating in the face of her advancing force, including Reim in July. Reim had long been considered a holy site, as it was in the cathedral of this city where the kings were consecrated with the holy oil. And so, with its capitulation, Charles entered Reim on the 16th of July. His coronation and anointing took place the next day on the 17th of July, 1429. Henry's counselors realized that a strong response was necessary following the coronation of Charles and the defeats at the hands of Joan of Arc. It was decided that Henry, despite his age, should be crowned and so preparations began. His coronation would take place on the 6th of November 1429 at Westminster, but this on its own would not be enough and so on the 23rd of April 1430, Henry set out for France alongside the Earl of Warwick, accompanied by a retinue of over 300 and an army at his back. Henry stayed first in Calais until the route to Rouen had been secured before setting out and arrived in the city at the end of July. It is noted that upon his arrival in Rouen, he was greeted by a cheering crowd and the noise was such that Henry asked that it be stopped, perhaps giving an indication of a sensitive nature. He was to remain there until such time as it was safe to make the journey to Paris, and to this end would be in Rouen for over a year. Early into his stay in France, Joan of Arc was captured in May 1430 by the Burgundians at the Siege of Compiègne. She would later be sold to the English, tried for heresy, and burnt at the stake in Rouen in May 1431. Although Henry was in Rouen at the same time as the trial took place, it is unclear whether he was present for any of the proceedings. 
It was at some point around this time that Henry VI's mother, Catherine, married her second husband, the Welsh Owen Tudor, in secret. Their first child, Edmund, would be born shortly after they were married. They would have two more sons, Jasper and Owen, and a daughter of whom little is known. Owen, as a Welshman, was granted letters of denizenship by Parliament in 1432, but the marriage was kept out of the public sphere. Henry finally arrived in Paris in December of 1431. His coronation took place on the 16th of December, but by all accounts, it was a hurried affair. The ceremony was performed by the now Cardinal Beaufort rather than a French bishop, and the feast that followed the ceremony was said to be disappointing. However, it is likely that the coronation was somewhat overshadowed, as just three days before, Philip, Duke of Burgundy, had concluded a truce with Charles VII that would last for the next six years. Henry left France on the 29th of January 1432 and would never return. During the years 1432 to 1436, the king was still in his minority. However, Henry was clearly starting to realize his position and in 1432, Warwick requested more power within his guardianship of the boy to protect himself from defiance on the part of Henry and any possible punishment amounting from his chastisements. At the same time, he also requested that those men of questionable virtues be kept apart from Henry to keep from influencing the impressionable young king. There was still friction among the council at this time, much of it involving Gloucester and Cardinal Beaufort, which was moderated in some part by Bedford. Their differences had been clear throughout their time serving together, but now it was their views on the continuing war in France that would come to the fore. Gloucester's views differed greatly from Beaufort's. There had been talk of making peace with the Armagnacs off and on for some years, but it wasn't until late 1435 that serious efforts to this end were made with the Congress of Arras in August and September 1435. The Congress, led by Beaufort, would not bring about peace, and just a week after it ended, Bedford died on the 14th of September. Another week after that, on the 21st of September, a treaty between the Burgundians and French was sealed, declaring the Burgundians' defection from the side of the English. The capture of Paris followed in April 1436. Henry attended his first council meeting in October 1435 in response to the failure of Arras and began taking an active role in government, although still guided by his councillors. But the roles played by Beaufort and Gloucester in trying to secure their influence over Henry, more so since Bedford's death, would serve to mould the king into someone who depended on others to tell him what to do, rather than allowing him to become a man confident in his own decision. Another prominent influence in his life, Warwick, his guardian of almost eight years, resigned the position in May 1436 with no replacement. By the end of July 1436, Henry signed his first warrant, a grant to Beaufort just days after Gloucester left for Calais. Henry continued through 1436 and 1437 to issue warrants, still alongside his council, rewarding and patronizing many of those that have been among his household through the years, with new roles within government and prominent positions in the kingdom. This included William de la Pole, the Earl of Suffolk, who had been steward of the household since 1433. Suffolk was appointed as chief steward of the Duchy of Lancaster, and like Beaufort and Gloucester, would become a major influence in Henry's reign. In 1437, the council tentatively began to consult the king on matters of appointment where it was said he deferred to their advice. In mid-1437, Henry asserted his piety in siding with Pope Eugenius IV against the Council of Baal. He also shared Beaufort's views that making peace in France would be preferable to continuing the conflict, giving Beaufort the opportunity to further exert his influence over the king. On the 12th of November 1437, a great council was convened and Henry announced his intention to step fully into his role as king whilst keeping his council. But 1437 not only marked Henry's step into ruling, 
His mother, Catherine, had fallen ill in 1436 and moved to Bermondsey Abbey later that year, where she was tended to. But she would die on the 3rd of January. Her two eldest sons and half-brothers to Henry would be placed in the care of Suffolk's sister, Catherine de la Pole, abbess of Barking Abbey, possibly at the suggestion of Suffolk to the king, whilst Owen Tudor would be imprisoned for two years. During Henry's minority, the kingdom's finances were already under strain from the continuing war in France, and frequently expenditure outstripped the income. On top of this, the crown inherited debt not only from Henry V, but also from Henry IV. On many occasions, the crown found itself in need of aid, and so they borrowed extensively. Cardinal Beaufort was one of their principal lenders, a vastly wealthy man he had already been lending to the crown under Henry V. Now, stepping into his reign, Henry's generosity to his expanding household and granting many patronages would further undermine attempts to balance the books. Early signs of the poor attention he gave to matters of rule, and perhaps something of a lack of understanding of resources, can be seen when he willingly signed a number of petitions which directly impoverished the crown and weakened the local governing of parts of the realm. These grants continued throughout his reign, and coupled with military expenditure and a worsening economy, would continue to adversely affect the finances of the realm. Despite attempts by the council to curb Henry's generosity, the worsening financial situation would contribute, in time, to rebellion. Although very willing to hand out grants of office, Henry lacked knowledge on the finer diplomatic points of his actions and realm. In 1441, among the many grants he handed out was the stewardship of the Duchy of Cornwall to the Earl of Devon, who'd made a petition to the king. Lord Bonville had been appointed royal steward in Cornwall for life in 1437, of which the Duchy of Cornwall fell within the bounds. The two men were already feuding at the time. Shortly after this appointment, Henry was forced to write to Devon and ask that he not take up the office until further discussions had taken place in the council, a request which Devon refused. Following violence between the parties, later in the year, both men would give up the stewardships and although the exact outcome of an arbitration in the following year is unknown, Devon still regarded himself as the rightful steward. This situation was not uncommon, and it has been suggested that in some cases Henry was uncertain whether the grants he made could be implemented, as many of them carried a caveat that they should only take effect if an identical patent had not already been issued. In a number of cases, duplicated grants that were contested by the newer party or those that were over-generous would have to be formally cancelled by members of the government. Throughout the 1440s, Henry also frequently interfered with justice. The court process during this period was complicated, and it was a difficult and long process for many to attain justice. Many cases would be referred to the King's Council, where the lower courts could not or would not make a judgment. Throughout this period, Henry issued many pardons for wide-ranging crimes, including attempted rape and murder, further undermining the struggling justice system. The immediate years following his minority were spent in the pursuit of peace with France, despite ongoing military campaigns of which Henry showed little in the way of decisive leadership. Indeed, it was noted that his interference in matters concerning France often proved a hindrance. Abortive attempts were made in 1438, before the Congress of Oi began in the summer of 1439, but would conclude only with a truce with the Burgundians. However, there was still the possibility of further discussions as the talks had not been formally terminated, and so, in 1440, Henry revisited the option of releasing the Duke of Orléans, who had been a prisoner in England since the Battle of Agincourt. Gloucester was staunchly against this idea, but with his militaristic attitude, his influence was waning, and it was the arguments of Beaufort and Archbishop Kemp, alongside advice from Suffolk, that swayed the king. It has been said that ultimately, Henry's decision to free Orléans 
lacked substance and was driven by his deep convictions for want of peace, given his lack of interest in military matters. Nevertheless, the first part of Orléans' ransom was raised by the French and he was released later that year at the beginning of November, but would quickly fail in his mission to broker a peace. It appears that Henry's mind was in part elsewhere during the negotiations when in September of 1440 and February of 1441, he founded Eton College and King's College, Cambridge, and involved himself in the supervision of their building. Eton was dedicated to the Virgin Mary and these acts of founding acted as much in the King's interest of education as it did his piety. Such was his interest in education, more than that of any other King, that there are records of Henry donating many of his own books to All Souls College in Oxford and King's Hall, Cambridge. In this promotion of education, he felt akin to Alfred the Great, and such was his admiration for Alfred that he dedicated much time and effort in 1442 to having him canonized, although his efforts would ultimately fail. It was in 1441 that Gloucester's influence over the king would finally come to an end when his second wife, Eleanor Cobham, with ambitions to be queen, sought the advice of astrologers and necromancers who predicted that Henry would succumb to sickness in the summer of 1441. Rumours of this soon circulated, and in July, she was arrested. She was forcibly divorced from Gloucester and imprisoned for the rest of her life. Gloucester's reputation would never recover. In 1443, after the failure of peace talks and further French victories, the decision was made to send another expedition to France. Both Normandy and the long-held Duchy of Gascony needed relief, but the treasury could not support two expeditions. And so eventually Gascony was selected, the force to be led by the first Duke of Somerset, John Beaufort. It has been suggested that the decision to undertake the campaign was down to Cardinal Beaufort, indeed Somerset was his nephew, but the campaign would end in failure. Somerset would die soon after his return to England, and Beaufort would retire from active duties as councillor, although he would still continue to exert some influence and offer informal counsel. Without the influences of Gloucester and Beaufort, Suffolk now moved to the fore. Given the perilous financial situation within England, drained further by the ongoing war, a peace was needed. And so, at the insistence of Henry, but not without some reluctance, Suffolk travelled to France in early 1444 to negotiate a marriage with Margaret of Anjou, the niece of Charles VII. Before departing, however, Suffolk made sure to protect himself and asked for a public declaration that neither he nor his colleagues would be held responsible should they fail, which Henry duly granted. The negotiations concluded on the 22nd of May, resulting in the betrothal of Margaret to Henry on the 24th and the sealing of a two-year truce on the 28th. Suffolk acted as proxy during the betrothal ceremony and on his return to England was richly rewarded, first with the wardship of Margaret Beaufort, the deceased Somerset's daughter, and later in the year was raised to the rank of Marquis. Suffolk would return to France at the end of 1444 to continue the negotiations and early in 1445 once again acted as proxy for Henry in his wedding to Margaret at Nancy. Margaret arrived in England in April, where, after recovering from a period of illness that had begun in France, made worse by the sea crossing, she journeyed to Titchfield Abbey and was married to Henry on the 22nd of April, 1445. Margaret would stay at one of Cardinal Beaufort's manors for a short time before making her way to London, where she arrived on the 28th of May and was crowned two days later. Rumours abounded, however, that during the negotiations, Suffolk had been instructed by the King to cede land to the French, and although he would report to Parliament that this was not the case, his reputation suffered. Suffolk kept his position, and over the ensuing years would increase his influence at court when many of his own men were appointed to prominent positions within the Council. 
The marriage seems to have been a happy one, and the king was generous with his wife, buying her jewels and horses, and in 1448, he allowed her to found Queen's College, Cambridge. They spent much time together in the royal palaces, but despite this, it would be eight years before a child was born of their union. Why it took the couple so long to produce an heir is unknown, but Henry was said to be of a prudish nature. Accounts survive of a visit to Bath in 1449, where he was said to be shocked and embarrassed to see men and women bathing naked together. Another similar event occurred at a Christmas pageant, which featured women with bared breasts, to which the king is said to have stormed out at the sight. Following his wedding, Henry actively sought peace with Charles VII. Both rulers were said to be enthusiastic about making an agreement, but only extensions to the truce were concluded. When the first of the French envoys arrived in London in 1445, Henry is noted to have greeted them personally showing almost excessive friendliness towards them. Although much of the negotiations took place between envoys, Henry did assert that he was happy to travel to France to speak in person to Charles. However, this meeting would never come to pass. Throughout the war, whenever peace was on the table, the English had been unwilling to cede land, but this was about to change. In December 1445, Henry wrote to Charles that he was willing to cede Maine to the French in the pursuit of peace between them. This act by Henry was in response to envoys from Charles and the Duke René, Margaret's father, and in return would enact a 20-year truce. Henry, acting on his own initiative, personally authorized the document, although in some part he was said to have been influenced by his wife in coming to this decision. The move by Henry was deeply unpopular and resisted by the English commanders in France. The original date for the session was to be the 30th of April 1446, but this day came and went without the land being handed over. Opposition to the current French policy in England was led, predictably, by Gloucester, who had always maintained a stance of not ceding any territory. A parliament, originally scheduled to take place in Cambridge, was rearranged to meet in Bury St Edmunds, a stronghold of Suffolk's influence, and Gloucester was summoned to attend. Rumours that Gloucester was plotting against Henry had seemingly been spread, and the king apparently believed them, for on Gloucester's arrival on the 18th of February 1447, he was denied access to the king and told to go instead to his lodgings. Gloucester was arrested later that day on a dubious charge of treason, but would not face trial until five days later, and on the 23rd of February, he was found dead. There has been some suggestion that Suffolk, along with others, persuaded the king of his uncle's intentions to raise the Welsh against him, as Gloucester had holdings there. But it is likely that Suffolk's true intent was to silence opposition to the French policy that he was now pursuing, albeit without the intention of the Duke's death. In order to prevent rumours of foul play, his body was displayed in church. In the following months, a number of those arrested alongside him were tried and sentenced to death by hanging, drawing and quartering, but in a show of mercy and compassion, Henry pardoned them as the executions were taking place and even allowed the return of their confiscated possessions and estates. But in years to come, the myth, the good Duke Humphrey, would cause many to believe that those in the king's service had conspired to bring about his death, damaging the standing of the king. There would be another prominent death for Henry in the same year, when the 72-year-old Cardinal Beaufort died on the 11th of April 1447. Both Henry and his queen were remembered in Beaufort's will, and were bequeathed a number of items as well as provision for substantial donations to Eton and King's College. But there was still opposition from his commanders in France. Henry authorized his new King's commissioners to use force, if necessary, to take custody of the holdings in Maine in preparation for the session in his fervent pursuit of peace. Finally, after much back and forth and dragging of heels by those appointed by Henry to facilitate the session, Maine was given over in March 1448 
but not without a show of force by Charles, who briefly laid siege to Le Mans. Ultimately, the extended truce granted by the session would be short-lived, and in the ensuing years, Henry would lose control of both Normandy and Gascony following an attack on the Breton town of Fougères by the English in March 1449. This attack was launched on the pretext of freeing the pro-English Gilles, brother to the Duke of Brittany and a great childhood friend of Henry, and was orchestrated by Suffolk and the second Duke of Somerset, Edmund Beaufort. The attack led to a French declaration of war in July. Other monarchs, such as Henry's own father, would have seized on the opportunity to lead a force to recapture the territory lost to the French, but this was not the case for Henry, and there is no suggestion of such an idea ever having been raised at the time. The Hundred Years' War would come to an end with the French victory in 1453. Henry's mismanagement of funds over the years and his fiscal prioritization of domestic projects and patronages rather than the war effort and lack of military leadership can in part be blamed for the English defeat. It was during this tumultuous time that the downfall of Suffolk and other prominent members of the council came about. In the years leading up to 1450, Suffolk's influence in court was prominent as fewer councillors attended meetings, and it has been suggested that he was attempting to strengthen his line by betrothing his eldest son to Margaret Beaufort. Owing to the situation in France and the loss of Rouen in October, Parliament was called late in 1449, and soon they were seeking a scapegoat for this disastrous turn of events. Dissatisfaction with the handling of France and anger over the loss of long-held territories was rife throughout the country. The first victim of the dissatisfaction was the keeper of the Privy Seal, Bishop Adam Molins, one of Suffolk's most fervent supporters, who was murdered in Portsmouth on the 9th of January 1450 by a soldier set to embark for France to go to the aid of Normandy. When Parliament reconvened after Christmas, late in January of 1450, Suffolk declared his loyalty to the Crown, but four days later, the House of Commons petitioned for his arrest. He was impeached on the 7th of February with many spurious charges, including treason, laid against him. On the 9th of March, Suffolk denied all charges before the King and Parliament. Finding himself to be in a difficult position, Henry would deal with the matter himself, and on the 17th of March, the Lords of Parliament and Suffolk gathered in his personal chamber. Suffolk once again protested his innocence and Henry dismissed the charge of treason, but found him guilty of lesser charges and sentenced him to banishment for five years in an effort to protect him. Suffolk was removed from London during the night of the 19th of March, but despite the secrecy, was hounded part of the way to his estate in Suffolk by a group of Londoners. Two days later, there was rioting in London. Due to start his banishment on the 1st of May, he took ship from Ipswich, heading for Calais, where he would continue his journey to the Duke of Burgundy's lands in the Low Countries, but his ships were intercepted in the Straits of Dover. He was taken aboard a ship called the Nicholas of the Tower, where he was held for a short while before being beheaded on the 2nd of May 1450. His body lay on a Dover beach, and it was said that his head was placed on a pole next to it. Given the unrest, when Parliament resumed on the 29th of April after the Easter break, it was held in Leicester, and the King would be in attendance. The issue of resumption had been put forward in previous sessions of Parliament, but initially Henry resisted any major implementation and insisted that his previous grants should stand so that his credibility would not suffer further. Now, in this latest session, the issue was raised again by the Commons. In an effort to take back a portion of lost revenue, a bill was put forward that would revert hereditary grants to life grants, thus returning land to the crown upon death. This bill pertained to all grants made by Henry since the start of his reign, but with some exemptions, as patronage had always been a part of a king's rule. It wasn't until the 6th of May, when news of Suffolk's death reached them, that the king accepted the bill. 
but in the coming month nearly 200 exemptions would be attached to it, thus defeating its purpose. The issue of resumption would be raised again in the next year's session of Parliament, 1450-51, given the failings of the first. Fewer exemptions would be made, but this time Eton and King's College were not entirely exempt as their grants were heavily burdening the Crown. Also, within this bill, Parliament tried to curtail the King in his future patronages by proposing that all future grants were to be examined by the three principal officers of state and a minimum of six councillors who would have the power to authorise them. However, Henry refused to give his consent to this part of the Act as he did not want his own initiatives restricted. Further exemptions were added to the bill before it was eventually passed by the King and proved to be somewhat more effective than the first bill in the return of revenue to the Crown. It was the very issue that resumption was trying to solve that led, in part, to the disaffection within the realm. Losses in France, the financial situation and ill-feeling towards those among Henry's councillors whom it was thought used their positions to benefit themselves, all added to growing tensions. Criticism had not been levelled at Henry, but the deaths of two of his closest advisers and feelings towards others highlighted just how little control he had. This disaffection was felt heavily in Kent, where a combination of French raids on the coast, slow recompense for the soldiers passing through the county to and from France, and the rumour that Kent was to be punished for Suffolk's death all added up to the beginning of a rebellion in late May of 1450 led by Jack Cade, also known as John Cade. Cade would also go under the alias John Mortimer, perhaps in an attempt to link himself to the Duke of York. News of the rebellion reached Parliament in Leicester on the 6th of June, and shortly after, Henry returned to London, but not before arrangements were made for two separate commissions of lords to quash the uprising. Before the forces could be raised, however, the rebels journeyed to Blackheath, arriving on the 11th of June, where they made camp. Initially, the plan was to suppress them, and Henry announced that he would accompany those charged with this duty to confront the rebels, but was soon persuaded by his councillors to change his mind after an assessment of their strength was made. Despite swearing loyalty, part of their demands was to see the removal of certain powerful men that surrounded the king. They were instead offered a pardon to return to their lands, and so dismissed negotiations. When Henry changed his mind again and decided to go heavily armed to Blackheath, they found on their arrival on the 18th of June that the rebels had withdrawn back to Kent. A small force of around 400 was sent in pursuit, but were ambushed and many were killed near Tunbridge. Those who survived fled. They were in turn pursued by a larger force who pushed through Kent indiscriminately, which only served to bolster the resolve of the rebels. Meanwhile, a growing number of those loyal to the crown threatened to defect unless certain high-ranking members within the king's circle, who they considered traitors, were arrested. Henry capitulated to their demands and ordered the arrest of Lord Say on the 19th of June. Say was a long-serving member of the council and had been one of Suffolk's supporters. The next day, Henry would publicly encourage the arrest of others who were considered traitors. Henry returned to Westminster and secretly summoned Lord Say from the Tower, likely an effort to offer his protection as he had done with Suffolk, but this order was refused by the constable. As the situation deteriorated and men defected to Cade, discussions were held in which Henry was persuaded to withdraw from London, and so, on the 25th of June, he left and made his way to Kenilworth Castle. Henry called for forces to be bolstered at Kenilworth for his protection, but made no effort to send troops to London. Sixty-nine years earlier, in 1381, Richard II had confronted the leaders of the Peasants' Revolt. Now it seemed that Henry's mind had changed again, and had no further intention to do so, choosing to flee instead. The defence of London was now in the hands of the Mayor and Common Council. With news of the King's departure, the rebels turned back to London and encamped in Southwark, 
just to the south of London Bridge, but initially were unable to enter London itself. The king's abandonment of the city had a demoralizing effect on those left to defend it, and when another rising occurred in Essex, rebel numbers were soon bolstered. Cade would cross the bridge on the 3rd of July, and despite previous pronouncements of keeping the king's peace, demonstrated by the beheading of one of his offending officers, he would involve himself in acts of criminality. As a conciliatory act to quell the disaffection, Henry, on the 1st of July, nominated a commission of Oyer and Termina to deal with those named as traitors. Cade was present for these sessions at the Guildhall. Many of those brought into the sessions were condemned, including Lord Say, who was brought from the Tower and denied the right to be tried by his peers, and William Cromer, Sheriff of Kent and Say's son-in-law. Say and Cromer were condemned and executed, and alongside many others, their heads were placed on spikes and paraded through the city. Say's lifeless body was dragged through the streets as they made their way to Southwark, attached to Cade's saddle. But it seems the Londoners had had enough, and on the night of the 5th of July, they fought the rebels and prevented them from crossing the bridge back into the city, eventually being able to close the gate, barring them from entering. The victory had been costly, and many citizens lay dead after the fight. Negotiations quickly followed, with the Queen offering a pardon to Cade. Following further negotiations and the receiving of petitions from the rebels, they were given charters of pardon. Many within the rebel force took up the offer of the pardon, but Cade shunned it and crossed back into Kent. He was proclaimed a traitor on the 10th of July, with a bounty of 1,000 marks placed on him, and the spoils he had taken were seized and sold off to raise funds. He was captured in Heathfield, Sussex, on the 12th of July, and died of wounds sustained in his apprehension. His naked body was brought back to Southwark and beheaded, and his head displayed on London Bridge. His body was drawn through the city, before being courted. Henry returned to London towards the end of July. Unrest continued in the southeast, and so another commission of Oyer and Termina was appointed to investigate those in connection with the complainants from Kent. Many royal officials and Kent landowners were brought before the justices, but their punishments, for those who were found guilty, were light. Similarly, those who continued with the rebellion having shunned the pardon were sought to make a show that treason would not be tolerated, but despite this, the trouble and dissension with royal officials continued well into 1451, spilling over into other areas across the country. Amidst the turmoil in 1450, Richard, Duke of York, the king's cousin, returned from Ireland, where he'd been lieutenant since December 1447 a post he'd previously held in France after Bedford's death. Unduly disturbed by the references to York throughout the rebellion, orders were issued by Henry's usher of the chambers to delay York's landing, and so when he attempted to land at Beaumaris in Anglesey, was denied, and would instead land further down the Welsh coast. When he eventually reached London on the 27th of September, he met with Henry briefly, and would stay in the city for two weeks. During this time, they communicated through a series of bills in which York rebuffed those he had been associated with during the rebellion and offered to take a leading hand in government to quell the disquiet. Henry acknowledged York as his loyal subject and beloved cousin, but instead of accepting his proposal, instead stated that a new council was to be established which York was to be a part of. After only two weeks, York left London to tour his estates in the Midlands before Parliament opened in November. On the 3rd of December of 1450, in order to quell the unrest that was rife in London, Henry and a great number of the lords rode out through the city. It seemed that this parade had the desired effect and tempers cooled. York was dispatched to punish the rebels still in Kent and Sussex later that month. Later in 1451, during the same session of Parliament, 
Henry refused the attainder against the deceased Suffolk proposed by the Commons and would appoint York's rival Somerset as captain of Calais. In what was to be the final session of Parliament, the issue of succession was raised by Thomas Young, an ally of York. As the king had so far failed to produce an heir, and with Bedford and Gloucester dead, there was no clear successor to Henry. Both Somerset and York had claims, but Thomas put it to Parliament that York should be acknowledged as heir presumptive, and the Commons refused to continue with any other business until York had been named. Henry was stirred to action and had Thomas arrested and sent to the Tower and immediately dissolved Parliament. York was dealt a further blow in 1452 when the Speaker of the previous Parliament session and one of York's allies, William Oldhall, was forcibly removed by order of Somerset from sanctuary at St. Martin the Grand Church. He was charged with looting possessions from Somerset's property during the Trouble in 1450, but also with the spurious charge of plotting against the King on York's behalf. This only served to inflame the feud that already existed between York and Somerset, who was, by now, a leading member of the government and firmly in Henry's favour. York gathered a host and marched to Dartford intent on removing Somerset, who, for his part, gathered a great number of the lords and the king himself, and went out to meet York, making camp at Blackheath. Negotiations were held at the beginning of March, and York laid out his grievances, most of which were against Somerset, but failed to gain the support of the king and lordly retinue. York was returned to London, and two weeks later made to swear a humiliating oath of allegiance to the crown in St. Paul's Cathedral. Following this, Somerset's influence grew in Parliament, whereas York would lose the Lieutenancy of Ireland to a man who he had once considered an ally, but who now moved towards Somerset's sphere of influence. The remainder of 1452 was spent in the continued effort of putting an end to those rebels still at large in Kent, to which end many were executed and their heads displayed on London Bridge, although Henry would issue another general pardon to all those but the murderers of the bishops Molins and Ayscoff. He would also embark on a judicial tour of lands held by York, making himself visible to the populace and took a hand in dispensing justice to those involved in the attempted uprising as one of the commissioners of Oyer and Termina. Henry accepted many petitions during this time, but some, at the direction of Somerset, were forced to submit to the king, while others were hanged. In October, they would see some success in France when Bordeaux was retaken, having been captured by the French the year before. But although there had been some discussion of Henry joining the campaign earlier in the year, this, once again, didn't happen. In November, Henry raised Edmund and Jasper Tudor to the earldoms of Richmond and Pembroke, positions that had once been held by his uncles Bedford and Gloucester, and in early 1453, Parliament accepted a petition to formally acknowledge the boys as the king's half-brothers. The wardship of Margaret Beaufort was given to the brothers, and Edmund would marry her in November 1455. At 13 years old, she would give birth to her only son, Henry Tudor, on the 28th of January 1457. More good news graced the court in 1453 when it was announced that Queen Margaret was pregnant with a long-awaited heir. Henry was generous in granting a reward to the messenger that brought him the news, but the modest recovery of Henry's rule was short-lived when the news came of a terrible defeat in France in July. Just a short while later, in early August 1453, Henry collapsed into a catatonic state while at the Royal Hunting Lodge in Clarendon. Henry's precise illness has not been identified, but it has been termed as a severe mental collapse, which left him completely incapacitated and in no way able to rule, even in appearance. It was said that he recognized no one, could not speak, nor clean or feed himself. His grandfather, Charles VI of France, had suffered bouts of madness during his life, where he would become violent, among other symptoms, 
but there is no suggestion that Henry suffered in this way. Initially, Henry's sickness was kept secret, but this state could not continue when he failed to recover after some weeks. Finally, after the birth of Henry's only child, Edward, on the 13th of October 1453, a great council was summoned, and among the High Lords, the Duke of York was invited to attend. Although he was encouraged to put aside his differences with Somerset in attendance at the council, York seized his chance to bring about his downfall. When the Duke of Norfolk launched a verbal attack accusing Somerset of treason for losses in France and demanding his imprisonment at York's request, the Lords consented, capitulating to the aggressiveness of the attack. York now stepped to the fore, but would be challenged by Queen Margaret, who, in January 1454, put forth her claim to the Regency. However, this was rejected outright by both Houses of Parliament before they made a concession and named Edward as Prince of Wales on the 15th of March. On the 27th of March, York was named as Protector of the Realm and Chief Counselor. During his term as Protector, York would appoint himself Captain of Calais, reclaim his Lieutenancy of Ireland, and appoint some of his own allies to the Council, including Richard Neville, Earl of Salisbury, as Chancellor. Henry finally recovered by Christmas 1454, although he had no memory of his period of illness, and straight away ordered gifts of thanks to be delivered to the shrine in Canterbury for his recovery. Henry acknowledged his son, ensuring the succession and would quickly undo much of what York had enacted as protector. Somerset was released from the tower and soon resumed his position within government, reclaiming the titles of Captain of Calais and Constable of England from York. The Duke of Exeter, imprisoned by York for his part in the violent feud between the Percys and Nevilles, was ordered to be released and Salisbury was removed as Chancellor. The Protectorate was formally ended and with York and his allies sidelined and fearing victimization, they left London and began raising an army. The initial intention by York and his allies was not to go to war, only to remove the traitors from around the King, namely Somerset and his allies. News of the approaching force prompted Henry to send a small delegation to negotiate with York, but to no avail. Henry and the court had been due to travel to Leicester for a great council on the 21st of May, but now it was decided to divert to St Albans to gather reinforcements before proceeding to Leicester. They were still a short distance from St Albans on the morning of the 22nd of May when news arrived that York was not far away with a larger force than their own. With this news, Henry appointed Humphrey, Duke of Buckingham, as Constable of England, a conciliatory action in the hope that York would be willing to negotiate with someone other than Somerset. The King's party continued on, but York reached St Albans first. Negotiations began in the King's name by Buckingham and Somerset, but it seems that Henry took no part in them. In stark contrast to the way he threw himself into making peace with France, it has been said that he seemed to show signs of confusion at this time, but after only an hour, the Earl of Warwick on the side of York, grew impatient and launched an attack on the town's barricades. Initially, the defenders held out until they were flanked by Warwick's men. Somerset and Henry Percy were killed and Henry, still under his banner in the marketplace, was wounded in the neck, but took no active part in the fighting. Henry hid in a tanner's house and was soon captured by York and taken to the abbey. He was not harmed by his captors, for York was fighting for, not against, the king. With Somerset dead, York, accompanied by Salisbury and Warwick, took Henry to the shrine in the abbey where Henry, with little choice in the matter, swore them as his liege men. York then ordered an end to the fighting in the name of the king. Henry was returned to London the next day, and on the 24th, paraded through the streets with York, Salisbury and Warwick by his side. On the 25th, in St Paul's Cathedral, York himself would hand Henry his crown. Henry would grant pardons to almost all who had fought alongside York in the July session of Parliament. By this time, York would briefly serve as Protector of the Realm again from the 19th of November, 
Although it has not been definitively proven, there is some suggestion that Henry was suffering from ill health at the time and was unable to attend Parliament or rule in his own right. However, York resigned the position in late February 1456, given the lack of support he received for another act of resumption that was put through Parliament and his authority would continue to wane throughout the year. At the same time, Queen Margaret would strengthen her position, replacing some of York's men with her own in offices of stature. The court moved to Coventry with Henry in August, where he was joined by Margaret and their son in September. But by this time, he presented a somewhat feeble image. During this time, Margaret's influence would grow not only with the king, but within her appointments of men loyal to her within government and on her son's council. For now, an uneasy peace held between the Yorkists and Royalists, and Henry would march at the center of the Love Day procession in London in March 1458, an act designed to reconcile the two sides. But when Warwick fled back to Calais after violence broke out between his men and the king's household after being summoned to a council, the situation began to deteriorate once again throughout 1459. Hostilities began anew on the 23rd of September 1459 with the Battle of Bloor Heath, the first battle of the Wars of the Roses, where the Lancastrians were to intercept Salisbury's force. The Lancastrian forces were routed, but Salisbury's force was much depleted by the time he met with York and Warwick. The Yorkists made one last appeal to Henry by letter, to which he replied that he would offer York, Warwick, and their men a pardon, excluding Salisbury, but only if they surrendered within six days. The two armies once again faced one another in the field at Ludford Bridge on the 12th of October, and despite rumours spread by the Yorkists that Henry was dead, he and Margaret accompanied their forces. Opening shots were fired by Yorkist artillery, but battle wasn't joined, and later that night a large number of men defected to Henry. Following this and sensing defeat, York, Salisbury and Warwick fled, leaving their men where they stood, unaware that their commanders had deserted them. York and his second son Edmund fled to Ireland, leaving his wife and two younger sons behind, while Salisbury, Warwick, and York's eldest son Edward went to Calais. The next morning, leaderless, the Yorkist forces surrendered, with most receiving pardons. Queen Margaret now stepped to the fore in punishing the Crown's enemies, attainting York and his associates and giving some of their confiscated possessions to trusted men of the crown, including Owen Tudor and his surviving son Jasper. But all attempts to dispose of the leading Yorkists failed and on the 26th of June 1460, Warwick and his men landed at Sandwich, reaching London by the 2nd of July. On the 10th of July, with the king and queen in attendance, the two sides faced one another outside Northampton. Already lacking in strength, part of the king's force defected to the Yorkists, causing many of the remaining soldiers to desert. Orders were issued that the king should not be harmed, and he was soon taken captive, while many of his lords were slain. Henry returned to London as a prisoner of Warwick, and Margaret fled, first to Wales before making her way to Scotland. In October, York returned to stake his claim for the crown by right of descent. There was much debate in Parliament, where Henry was not in attendance, and finally it was agreed that York would be named heir to the throne in place of Henry's son on the 31st of October 1460. York and his son Edmund were killed outside Sandal Castle near Wakefield on the 30th of December 1460 in pursuit of Queen Margaret, who still vehemently opposed them and had gathered an army to deal with the Yorkists. Salisbury's son would also die in the battle, while Salisbury himself was captured and beheaded the following day. Their heads were then put on display on the gates of the city of York. Margaret joined the army in January 1461, and they began advancing south. Warwick, taking Henry with him, 
went north with his force, and once again the two armies met in St. Albans on the 17th of February. The Lancastrians won the day, and Henry was recovered from the Yorkists to be reunited with his family. He was overjoyed at his release and knighted his son. Warwick had fled the field and was met on the road by York's elder son, Edward, making his way to London from his own victory against Jasper Tudor at Mortimer's Cross, Herefordshire. At the same time, the Lancastrian court was also making its way to London and would arrive first. Arrangements were made with the mayor for them to enter the city, but when they approached Cripplegate on the 22nd of February, the citizens of London barred the gates against them. In contrast, Edward was welcomed into the city on the 27th of February, cutting a much more striking and royal figure than Henry. In the following days, Henry was denounced as unfit to rule. Edward IV assumed the crown on the 4th of March, 1461. The Battle of Toton would follow at the end of March, but Henry, Margaret, and Edward were not present, having already travelled north to York. They then found refuge in Scotland, where plans were made to reclaim the kingdom. Henry still had supporters and many would join him in Scotland, where they raided over the border a number of times. Margaret travelled to France to negotiate with the new King Louis XI, an agreement was struck in 1462, and she returned to Scotland. But it was countered by the sealing of a truce between England and France in mid-1463. A truce was then concluded with Scotland in December 1463, which ended their refuge in the country. The Lancastrians were forced back into northern England, where they kept up resistance and would fight a number of battles, but were ultimately defeated. At this point, Henry seemed to be a little more than a figurehead and stayed away from the battles. Following the defeat, he went on the run, seeking shelter from his sympathizers, but was eventually caught by a group of men in Lancashire on the 13th of July 1465 and was taken back to the tower. By the time Henry was captured, Margaret had been in France for two years with her son, still seeking aid for their cause. Warwick made his way to France in 1470 after a failed uprising against Edward IV, relations between the two had broken down, and now with aid from Louis XI, Margaret and Warwick were reconciled. Warwick agreed to betroth his daughter to Henry's son, Prince Edward of Westminster, and they married in December 1470. By this time, Edward was already the opposite of his father with his martial nature. Warwick invaded England in the autumn of 1470, and Edward IV fled, having been deserted by many of his supporters. On the 3rd of October 1470, Henry was once again proclaimed king, but took no hand in ruling and was said to be extremely passive for the few short months he sat on the throne. Edward IV invaded England with a small army in March 1471 and gathered support as he marched south. With Margaret and her forces still in France, it was left to Warwick to throw back the invasion, a task at which he utterly failed, preferring instead to wait within the walls of his castle in Coventry to be reinforced. Edward IV marched on London. Henry was paraded through the streets to give heart to people at the news of the invading force, but it was said to have much the opposite effect and Edward entered the city on the 11th of April, 1471. Henry was immediately taken into custody and returned to the tower. Margaret, Prince Edward, and their forces landed just three days later on the 14th, but their advance north was halted by Edward IV at the Battle of Tewkesbury on the 4th of May. Prince Edward was killed during the battle, and Margaret was taken prisoner. Henry, still in the tower, was killed on the 21st of May, 1471, likely on the orders of Edward IV, though not by his own hand. History has often looked on Henry VI as mad, empty-headed, or an imbecile, a reluctant ruler who was not fit to hold the crown. But powerful influences acting on him from birth led to a dependency in life that would never leave him, and in the wake of his father's death, 
he had no kingly example from which to learn and form the basis of his own rule, nor experience of growing up in court in any other position than king. Some historians have even suggested that Henry was merely a puppet through which others ruled. There is no evidence that Henry was frail or simple-minded, nor that he suffered any unusual ill health in his younger years and was noted to be calm in his temperament and overtly pious. He was of a generous nature, but such was his generosity that it was of detriment to himself in a time when finances throughout the realm were stretched by war and an economic slump. This generosity also highlights the confusion he seems to have borne in matters pertaining to governance when he frequently duplicated grants. He was well-intentioned and took interest in some aspects of his rule, but seems not to have had the necessary political and diplomatic acumen that a king of the time required. Henry certainly cannot be said to have inherited his father and grandfather's militaristic tendencies, but was merciful and compassionate to a fault, issuing many pardons over the years, some of which were certainly undeserved and went against the advice of his counsel. His dependency on those around him, especially his wife in the later years of his reign, would intensify as he became increasingly withdrawn and possibly disillusioned with his role. This would result in much strife over many years and highlights that despite his best intentions, his inattention and lack of interest in many matters made his rule, for the most part, ineffectual. What do you think of King Henry VI? Was he an ineffectual king who was unfit for the role, or was he a kind-natured king and a victim of circumstance? Please let us know in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Edward Plantagenet, who would become King Edward IV of England, was born on the 28th of April 1442 in Rouen, Normandy. He was the third of twelve children, seven of whom survived to adulthood, and the eldest surviving son and heir of the third Duke and Duchess of York, Richard Plantagenet and Cecily Neville. At the time of his birth, Edward's father, Richard, Duke of York, held command of the French campaign in Normandy on behalf of King Henry VI. Edward lived in his parents' lavish establishment in Rouen until he was three years old with his elder sister Anne, their younger brother Edmund, and their younger sister Elizabeth. Only three of the seven children whom Duchess Cecily gave birth to between 1446 and 1455 survived their infancy. Margaret and Edward's most famous younger brothers, George and Richard. Less than a year after Elizabeth's birth in 1444, the family departed Rouen and returned to England, taking up residence at Fotheringhay Castle in Northamptonshire. Over the next few years, the family divided their time amongst their various estates, but likely lived most consistently at Fotheringhay and at Ludlow Castle in Wales. Next to the king himself, Richard Plantagenet was the greatest landowner in England, with estates in more than 20 counties, as well as estates in Ireland. His annual income is estimated to have been about £7,000, equivalent to approximately £4.3 million today. Very few specifics are known about Edward's childhood and early education, but much can be inferred based upon the historical documents from his reign, the instructions Edward gave for his own son's education, and based on what is generally known about the child-rearing and educational practices of the English aristocracy during the 15th century. Duchess Cecily may have taken aspects of her children's early education in hand personally, such as religious instruction and basic literacy. Cecily, however, was engaged in the near-constant business of childbearing until her eldest children, including Edward, were well into their adolescence. Additionally, she was the Duchess of York, the Lady and the Chatelaine of Great Estates, and might presumably have relied more heavily on nurses instead, 
had she not had the time to see to her children's daily needs and early education herself. This is quite likely, as Edward reportedly formed a strong bond with his childhood nurse in Normandy, Anne of Coe, and often spoke warmly of his young childhood under her care. During his later reign, he granted her an annual pension of twenty pounds. Edward and Edmund were sent to live at Ludlow Castle under the care of a governor, or male guardian, and began lessons with a resident private tutor around the ages of six or seven. All of the York boys studied Latin and French, showing impressive proficiency in both languages later in life. They also most likely studied arithmetic, history and literature, as well as music, dance and social etiquette, which were important accomplishments for courtly life. They received extensive military training, including riding, sword play and jousting. These martial skills would have had to be mastered with the boys fully armoured, adding another layer of required skill altogether. Military strategy and manoeuvres may well have been part of their history lessons or military training, as Edward later demonstrated consistent success and a talent for leadership on the battlefield. Edward likely also received training in property law and estate management, which might demonstrate that the Duke of York had not yet begun to envision either himself or his eldest son taking the throne until the late 1450s. Estate management was the province of a nobleman rather than a king, and such training might explain Edward's notably active personal engagement with the law, justice and the royal finances during his reign, which was not typical of medieval kings. As a young man, Edward was noted for his charm, charisma, and his sharp intelligence. But for all his fine education, Edward did not prove to be an academic or an intellectual. He enjoyed reading and commissioning printed and exquisitely illuminated books bound in silk and velvet for his personal library, a large portion of which has survived and been preserved. Edward's personal literary taste ran heavily toward chivalric romances and popular histories of great men, great deeds and glorious battles, written mostly in French and English, which he read for his own pleasure. However, he owned few texts in Latin, the language of European intellectualism, and showed little interest in the emerging philosophical currents of humanism or in any other particularly scholarly pursuits. Edward naturally also owned several religious texts, but he does not seem to have been particularly devout in his religious sensibilities. His mother, Cecily Neville, was known to have been a devotedly pious woman with a strong scholarly interest in the writings of female Christian mystics such as Bridget of Sweden and Catherine of Siena. Edward, however, seems not to have heavily absorbed the intellectualism of the age or his mother's reportedly notable piety and consistently demonstrated his interest in more worldly pursuits. He was described by his contemporaries as eminently able, cheerful, gallant and generous with a good and even temper. Edward was well liked for his friendly, engaging manner and his ability to be at ease in any company not typical of young men raised to be kings, which of course Edward was not. He was also exceptionally daring and confident, even to the point of vanity, both regarding his abilities and the plantagenet good looks he had inherited. Multiple observers and chroniclers remarked upon Edward's exceptional handsomeness. The most well-known portrait of Edward IV, which hangs in London's National Portrait Gallery, shows a rather tired, middle-aged man with more than a few extra pounds on his frame, with dark brown hair and light brown eyes. However, this portrait was painted circa 1540, nearly 60 years after Edward's death. Documentary sources from Edward's time do suggest that he gained a great deal of weight as he approached middle age, thanks to his prodigious indulgence in fine wine and food. When Edward's tomb at Windsor was opened in 1789, Visitors reportedly left with locks of his hair. Several such swatches and strands of brown hair, purporting to have been Edward's, have been sold at auction in recent years. However, it is now known that some of Edward's siblings were fair-haired and blue-eyed, 
and he himself reportedly had several fair-haired or red-haired children. It is therefore possible that Edward was born with blonde or reddish-blonde hair, which darkened as he aged, and he may have had lighter-colored eyes than his portraits depict. We do know for sure that Edward stood at least 6 foot 3 inches or 191 centimeters tall, which was quite exceptional for medieval Europe, where the average adult male was usually no taller than roughly five and a half feet, little more than 160 centimetres. Sir Thomas More later described Edward as strong and clean made, or well proportioned with broad shoulders. In his youth, the tall, handsome, charming and vigorous Edward must have cut quite an impressive figure on horseback. Predictably, not the least notable of Edward's qualities was his love for the company of women which his conduct throughout his romantic life, even as a married man, makes plain. Left to his own devices, Edward almost certainly would have lived a predictable life as the fourth Duke of York, willingly serving the king, inheriting the bulk of his father's estates, marrying, having children, and likely supporting a score of mistresses and their illegitimate children until his death. As it was, he was the first-born son of a family with a legitimate claim to the English throne, in a country where the royal succession was dangerously murky. What made the situation more unstable was the perceived weakness of the reigning king, Henry VI, whose precarious health and reluctance to rule in the traditional fashion of medieval warrior kings forced the nobles surrounding him to exercise power in his name. The growing influence of the king's few favoured ministers fostered competition and enmity amongst other prominent members of the English nobility. As a result of these conditions, almost from the very beginning, Edward's life and duty was given over to the advancement and indeed the survival of his family. Through his mother, Richard, Duke of York, was the legitimate great-grandson of Lionel of Antwerp. First Duke of Clarence, the second surviving son of the last undisputed King of England, Edward III. Through his father, Richard was also descended from Edward III's fourth surviving son, Edmund, first Duke of York. Edward III's eldest son, also named Edward and known as the Black Prince, had only a single male heir, Richard II, who subsequently had no children of his own. The Yorks later claimed that the closest male heir to the throne after the death of Richard II was actually the one-year-old infant Roger Mortimer, the grandson of Lionel and the grandfather of Richard, Duke of York. The Duke would come to emphasize this lineage heavily by 1460, when the crown was within his grasp. Up until then, Richard Plantagenet had been content to emphasize his lineage only from the first Duke of York. This was most likely due to two factors. First, Richard was descended from the Mortimers, not through his father, but through his mother, which weakened claims of inheritance in a society which favored sons. Additionally, Lionel, Duke of Clarence, had had no sons, but only a daughter, Philippa, while John of Gaunt, the third surviving son of Edward III, had borne a legitimate son, Henry Bolingbroke. Interestingly, while primogeniture remained overwhelmingly prevalent for centuries within English laws of inheritance, Edward IV was not the first king of England to stake a claim to the throne based upon the inheritance of a female ancestor, and neither would he be the last. Nonetheless, Richard, Duke of York, seemingly came to believe that his line had a claim to the English throne as good or better than did the reigning king, Henry VI, of the ruling House of Lancaster, whose grandfather, Henry Bolingbroke, had usurped the throne from his cousin, Richard II. As we can see, a large part of the problem was that Edward III and his queen, Philippa of Hainault, had had so many children, most crucially five sons, who survived to adulthood. Most medieval kings were lucky to have an heir and a spare. During the lifetime of Edward III and those of his many sons, there was little indication of the turmoil in which their increasingly numerous descendants would become embroiled. Overlapping with the Hundred Years' War with France, this period of roughly a century of major competition for the throne of England has been called the Wars of the Roses, 
after the badges worn by the opposing branches of the royal family, the White Rose of York and the Red Rose of Lancaster. Tensions rose between the ruling House of Lancaster and the House of York during the late 1440s and 1450s. Edward's father, Richard, found himself frequently sidelined in favour of the Lancastrian Dukes of Suffolk and Somerset, who not only held the king's ear, but also received positions and preferments not extended to the Duke of York. In 1446, the Duke of York's command post in Rouen was given instead to Edmund Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, which some historians see as the beginning of the bad blood between York and Lancaster. What made this situation more problematic was that by the 1450s, the crown was deeply in debt to the Duke of York to the tune of almost 100,000 pounds. About 20% of this debt comprised loans the Duke had made to the crown, which remained unpaid, but the bulk of it represented unpaid wages for the Duke's several years of service in France. Meanwhile, the King's Lancastrian ministers regularly received repayment of loans made to the Crown, including interest. The increasingly precarious state of England's economy by the early 1450s sparked rebellion in Kent and the southeast of England. Rebels, led by the Irishman Jack Cade, demanded the removal of the King's evil, greedy and spendthrift advisers in favour of a broader representation of those men of good and noble birth. The Dukes of York, Exeter, Norfolk and Buckingham were the names put forward most prominently by the rebels. Naturally, the Lancastrians suspected York of fermenting the rebellion to facilitate his own advancement, especially since Jack Cade took on the name of John Mortimer during the rebellion to associate himself with the Duke's perceived legitimacy as a Prince of the Blood. However, studies of the Kentish Rebellion indicate that local political and judicial corruption was viewed by the rebels as manifestations of similar corruption at King Henry's court, and the tendency to demand the removal of evil councillors in favour of others was fairly typical in past rebellions. Until the birth of King Henry's son, Edward of Westminster, the Duke of York was technically the nearest claimant to the throne, and thus the most prominent man of good and noble birth in England next to the King himself. This should not suggest, however, that the English people would support Henry's removal in the Duke's favour, which Richard Plantagenet would eventually discover to his own detriment. King Henry had been just a baby when he became King. Later, his lack of interest in government and his delegation of responsibility for his French territories to his Lancastrian favourites eventually resulted in the loss of all French lands won by his father, Henry V, save for Calais. This contributed to massive resentment of the King's Lancastrian advisers and of the King himself. Many English people looked bitterly upon the many decades, the vast sums of money and the countless lives which appeared to have been wasted conquering France, only to lose almost all they had gained to the ineptitude of the King and his closest ministers. When Henry VI began to suffer mental health crises during the 1450s, the Duke of York was twice declared Lord Protector during the King's incapacity. Parliament and many of York's contemporaries distrusted the notion of a regency controlled by King Henry's Queen, Margaret of Anjou. Queens of England often perceived such wariness from the English people because they were frequently foreigners. Foreign members of court were always suspected of being spies, and queens who attempted to exercise power were invariably accused of wrongfully usurping kingly prerogatives. In reality, any move Queen Margaret made to help secure her husband's throne or her son's inheritance would be viewed with hostility by the great men of the realm. Margaret observed the growth of the Yorkist cause with alarm and a determination to defeat the man who seemed bent on taking her own son's place as heir to the throne. Noble families equally dissatisfied with the influence of Queen Margaret and the King's Lancastrian ministers at court joined the Yorkist cause, most particularly Duchess Cecily's clan, the powerful Northern Neville family, represented by her brother Richard, Earl of Salisbury, and his highly charismatic son, also named Richard, Earl of Warwick. As the Yorkist faction cultivated support, 
primarily in London and the southeast of England, and secured foreign strongholds in France and Ireland as effective springboards for invasion, Queen Margaret strove to rally support in the Lancastrian strongholds in the Midlands. The first Battle of St Albans in May of 1455 was little more than a skirmish, but it set the English people on the path toward a series of internal conflicts which would cause the crown to change hands no less than six times in the next 30 years. The beginnings of the civil war in England, which developed over roughly a decade and a half, encompassed virtually all of Edward's childhood. He was most likely at Ludlow Castle in 1452, observing the Duke of Somerset presiding over the trials of those who had served Edward's father, who took part in an attempted coup, after which the Duke of York had fled to Ireland. At the age of 11, Edward accompanied his father to London in his role as Lord Protector to open Parliament, where Edward was formally recognised for the first time as the Earl of March and his father's heir. At the age of 12, he reportedly led a force of 10,000 men from Ludlow in a march on London to liberate his father from prison. The Yorkist advance was swiftly reported and the Duke was released before their arrival. As the Lancastrian and Yorkist factions edged closer towards open warfare, Edward and his younger brother Edmund were increasingly involved in politics and military mobilisation and were already expected to take on leadership roles. A letter written in June 1454 from the two boys to their father assured the Duke that Edward and Edmund were being dutiful in their studies and their military training. We trust to God, the boys wrote, that your gracious lordship and good fatherhood will be pleased. Following the First Battle of St Albans in 1455, the recovered Henry VI, who desired peace above all else, sought to reconcile the great men of England and end the factional fighting, but the next four years were nonetheless fraught with open hostility at court and the recruitment of ever more armed retainers by both the Lancastrians and the Yorkists. In June of 1459, there was a meeting of the Great Council at Coventry, to which no member of the York faction was invited. The Lancastrian attendees emerged with legal indictments for the Duke of York and his cohorts, who immediately organised themselves to march in force on the capital. It was their intention to attempt a peaceful settlement with the King, who desired the same. But the Queen's Lancastrian forces intercepted the Earl of Salisbury's forces at Ludford Bridge. Following this struggle, the Yorks were attainted for treason, which basically forced them into open rebellion. After the rout at Ludford in October 1459, Edward's family and supporters were separated as each fled the country. The Duke of York fled to Ireland with his son, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, while Duchess Cecily and her younger children were taken into custody of King Henry. They were exempted from the attainder, however, and treated kindly and generously. Meanwhile, Edward took shelter with his uncle Salisbury and his cousin Warwick in Devon. Later, they covertly made their way to Calais. Warwick had been appointed Captain of Calais during the Duke of York's second stint as Protector, and thanks to Warwick's charisma and his skill at diplomacy and public relations, this last English stronghold in France was well reinforced with Yorkist supporters and sympathisers. Duke Richard likewise cultivated support for the Yorkist cause among the Irish earls and within six months, the York faction were able to mount a successful invasion of England from both Ireland and France. Prior to the invasion, the Earl of Warwick spearheaded a widespread PR campaign to clarify the rebels' motives. He wrote dozens of letters and sent them to all regions of England. He also penned a manifesto to which he, Edward, and their respective fathers, the Dukes of Salisbury and York, all signed their names. The manifesto assured the people of England that the York faction were interested only in banishing corruption and restoring order and good government to the realm. They swore their loyalty to King Henry and their commitment to serve him, but protested that his evil counsellors had passed the sentence of attainder against the Yorks in order to profit from their loss and death. Edward and Warwick landed at Sandwich in late June of 1460, 
accompanied by 2,000 men. They began their march to London, gathering supporters as they went. They knew that King Henry was marshalling his troops and reinforcing his position at Northampton, and that even now Queen Margaret's forces were advancing on London. Margaret's army, however, had earned a fearsome reputation among the merchant class as well as the common people. News of the pillaging and burning of towns along their route to London terrified the people of the capital and the city decided to keep its gates fastened against the Lancastrian army. This course of action proved preferable when it became known that the Earls of March and Warwick would arrive in London at any moment. Queen Margaret, betrayed by the English people, many of whom hated and feared her, and unwilling to force her way into the capital, retreated north once again. On the 2nd of July, Edward and Warwick were warmly welcomed into the city by London's mayor, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and other assembled dignitaries and spectators, while the wary and outraged Lancastrian garrison withdrew into the tower. It seems highly unlikely that deposing King Henry and taking the throne for themselves was the goal for any of the Yorks at this point. It certainly does not seem to have been so for Edward and Warwick. They explained again that they desired above all else only to meet with and assert their loyalty to the king, whom they were certain would lift their sentences of attainder and restore their titles, fortunes and inheritances, which had been revoked by the charges of treason. They promised then to help restore good government of the realm under King Henry. If, however, the king's counsellors persisted in setting him against the House of York, his loyal subjects, they would have no choice but to fight. A corporate loan of £1,000 was extended to Edward and Warwick from the merchants of London to pay the soldiers who would fight in the coming battle. This relatively modest sum is somewhat telling. It suggests that the people of the capital trusted Edward more than Queen Margaret, but probably not by much. Further, it illustrates that the people of London believed Edward and Warwick when they insisted that they had no plans to depose the king, for why would they fund such a venture? And if they were willing and desirous to have Henry deposed, why would they not have given the Yorks a more generous loan? Two days after his arrival, Edward led his army out of London, arriving at Northampton on the 9th of July. Warwick was sent to negotiate with the Duke of Buckingham, who was quite unwilling to allow Warwick to see the king. There seemed to be no other course but to fight. Edward, Warwick, and Warwick's uncle William Neville, Lord Falkenberg, each led one of three troop columns. The Yorks seemed to be facing an uphill battle at Northampton. They were outnumbered at least two to one, the king's forces occupied a reinforced position and had the use of several large cannon. The Battle of Northampton was, in fact, the first military engagement in English history in which field artillery was actually present on the battlefield. Unfortunately for the Lancastrians, the 10th of July 1460 was an excessively rainy day, rendering their cannon useless. Further, the vanguard, commanded by Lord Edmund Grey, defected to the Yorkist side early in the battle, shifting the momentum quickly in the favour of York. With these rather fortunate advantages, the struggle lasted little more than half an hour. The number of casualties were not reported on the York side, which might suggest that they were minimal. 300 men fell on the Lancaster side, including the Duke of Buckingham, and all of the other high-ranking royalist captains. Edward and Warwick found King Henry in his tent, having been captured and detained by a Yorkist archer. They greeted him respectfully and informed him that they had come to escort him back to London. Though he was still the king, Henry was now effectively Edward and Warwick's prisoner. The Yorks entered London once again on the 16th of July in triumph. After the Lancastrian garrison at the tower surrendered, the Yorks issued writs summoning Parliament for the 7th of October, where they planned to reverse the attainders of treason cast upon them by the Coventry meeting of June 1459. This was indeed the first act of the Parliament which met in October of 1460. 
Edward, Warwick, and all the rest of the Yorkist supporters seemed content with this state of affairs, and it seems doubtful that any of them would have considered that deposing the king would be a good idea. King Henry was their greatest political asset, and as long as they could keep the most powerful and troublesome Lancastrians from court and sufficiently intimidated, their influence and prosperity was assured. Richard, Duke of York, however, seemed recently to have developed much loftier ambitions than simply regaining his former titles and properties or contenting himself with the position of second most powerful man in England. Documentary sources confirm that as early as the 8th of September 1460, only three weeks after the writ summoning Parliament had been issued, the Duke of York had dropped King Henry's regnal year from all of his correspondence, dating all of his communications instead using this year of grace, which was highly unusual. When he arrived in London for the Parliament in October, he rode like a king at the head of his retainers, his sword unsheathed and held upright before him in unmistakably royal fashion, his banners proudly displaying the royal arms of England. When he strode confidently into Parliament, laid his hands upon the throne, and declared himself king by virtue of his descent from Lionel, Duke of Clarence, elder brother of King Henry VI's great-grandfather John of Gaunt, he was greeted with stunned and uneasy silence. Duke Richard's claims were apparently a step too far. What is noteworthy about the reaction to these proceedings is that the Parliament and its attendees were overwhelmingly pro-Yorkist. Yet, they clearly still had no desire to revisit the instability of a usurpation, nor were they willing to repudiate solemn oaths of loyalty, which they had all sworn to King Henry. Edward was almost certainly present at this historic Parliament, and one can only imagine what he thought of his father's actions in that moment. But if the reactions of York's Neville relations are any indication, it is possible that he was as embarrassed and taken aback as they. For, whether or not they knew of the Duke's intentions, neither Salisbury nor Warwick spoke a word or made any gesture in support of the Duke's claim. The Commons declined to deliberate on such academic matters of succession, leaving it to the Lords to decide. Most of the power brokers present distrusted and disliked Margaret of Anjou and had clearly bought into the convenient rumours that her son, Edward of Westminster, was not King Henry's son and was therefore illegitimate. With the Act of Accord, Parliament ultimately recognised the Duke as the legitimate heir to the throne upon Henry's death, but would not consent to the deposition of the King. Parliament and the Yorks had reckoned without Queen Margaret, however, whose suspicions that the Duke of York sought to dethrone her husband and disinherit her son had now been totally confirmed. She began to marshal her forces in the north of England, and loyal Lancastrians flocked to join her army at Hull. Most problematic for the Yorkist cause was that their main holdings and properties were in the north and many of them were now being raided and despoiled by the Lancastrians. In early December, the Duke of York departed for the north at the head of his army together with his son Edmund and his brother-in-law Salisbury. Meanwhile, Edward was sent to Wales to recruit troops and Warwick stayed behind to hold London. Then, at the news of his father's death at the Battle of Wakefield, Edward prepared to depart for London, but changed his plans to meet the advancing forces of Jasper Tudor at Mortimer's Cross. Following Edward's victory, he learned of the unfortunate losses suffered by Warwick and his men at the Second Battle of St Albans. Warwick had been wounded, and King Henry had been recaptured by the Lancastrians, but the City of London had shown her Yorkist colours once again and shut their gates to Margaret of Anjou. Now that his father was dead, the 18-year-old Edward was the heir to the House of York. They had secured the capital and still had the support of many in Parliament, but they had lost King Henry, who had been the pivot around which Yorkist authority had coalesced. It may be convincingly argued that Edward believed that the only option now was to assume the throne himself. He had not been the one to set his family upon this path, 
but they must seemingly stay on it or be destroyed. Edward almost certainly understood, as did the rest of his family and his supporters, that if they yielded the throne back to King Henry, none of them would be likely to survive the wrath of Margaret of Anjou or other loyal Lancastrians. He had not intended to assume the throne, but the fact that he acted quickly and decisively when he believed it necessary testifies to his confidence. Given the popular disaffection with the regime of King Henry VI, as well as popular dislike of his queen, perhaps Edward believed that he could only do better. The fact that Edward was essentially thrust upon the throne by the actions of his father and the vagaries of circumstance should not suggest, however, that he found becoming king unwelcome, or that he in any way hesitated to exercise the powers and prerogatives of a king when the opportunity arose. Edward's entry into London on the 26th of February 1461 and the events of the next nine days were carefully choreographed. Both he and Warwick were warmly received by the people. One chronicler reported a verse being sung in Edward's praise among Londoners in the days following his arrival. Let us walk in a new wine yard, let us make a gay garden in the month of March, with this fair white rose and herb, the Earl of March. Edward's lineage and its superiority to the lineage of the Lancastrian usurpers was emphasized in public speeches. On the 3rd of March, the new Great Council, thrown together rather quickly, met and agreed to accept Edward as king. On the morning of the 4th of March, he attended Mass at St. Paul's before processing to the Great Hall at Westminster. There, the Archbishop of Canterbury administered Edward the Oath. He was draped in royal robes, crowned with the cap of a state, and took his seat upon the King's bench, scepter in hand. After this rather rapid coronation, the more formal incarnation of which would come a few months later, Edward IV was proclaimed King throughout the capital. Just two days later, dozens of proclamations, writs and letters were sent out to help consolidate the new Yorkist regime. The English people were invited to pledge their loyalty to the new king. All who had served in the Lancastrian cause against the Yorkist were promised a full pardon and the retention of their property on condition they submit to the new monarchy, except for a short list of roughly two dozen high-ranking Lancastrians and anyone with an income of more than 100 marks per year, which was virtually all of the nobility and gentry. Using this strategy, Edward placed far more pressure on the English elite to support his right to rule. Further, it was decreed that anyone who killed or captured and handed over a high-ranking Lancastrian enemy to King Edward would receive a reward of £100. These measures were effective to a point, but there was still far more to do to bring England under Edward's control. The Yorkists held London and the southeast and were steadily cultivating greater support in the south, but Wales and the north of England remained a patchwork of Lancastrian, Yorkist and regional loyalties which would take more time and effort to subdue and stabilise. Additionally, the general instability wrought by civil war in England had emboldened the Scots to begin raids and hostile incursions over the northern border. Edward had less than three weeks in London to plan his next move before he went out on campaign again. On the 13th of March, he departed London leading an army headed for Yorkshire. The Battle of Towton, fought on the 29th of March 1461, was the bloodiest of the entire civil war, with likely the highest casualties of any battle ever fought on English soil. Estimates of those killed at Towton ranged from as few as 9,000 to 28,000. Roughly 75% of the English peerage had at least one family member present at the battle, and based on the number of retainers each was capable of putting into the field, a maximum estimate of 50,000 men engaged at the peak of battle is not far-fetched. Edward's forces were significantly outnumbered. 
but his typical approach of bold, courageous offensive and conscientious use of every advantage eventually routed the main Lancastrian forces. The armies of Lancaster occupied the higher ground, but the Yorkist archers took advantage of the harsh, bitter winds and snow blowing into their enemies' faces, unleashing a barrage of arrows into the Lancastrian ranks. Meanwhile, the high winds and reduced visibility rendered the Lancastrian archers nearly useless. Incensed, they charged down the hill towards the enemy and Edward's army rushed out to meet them. The battle raged all day, but despite their superior numbers, the Lancastrians were eventually defeated and the survivors were routed by nightfall. Towton constituted a major consolidation of Edward's power. It precipitated the flight to Scotland of Henry VI, Margaret of Anjou, and their son, Edward of Westminster. It had cut a swathe through the English nobility and crippled their ability to resist the new Yorkist regime. It had loosened the Lancastrian grip on the north of England by removing the royalist northern earls, leaving the region open to greater control by the Yorkists. Some Lancastrian loyalists had escaped, but many had fled the country with the royal family. Finally, Towton had allowed Edward to cover himself in glory and legitimate his claim to the throne, not just by right of birth, but by right of conquest as well. Edward's reign lasted roughly two decades and is unique in English history. He is the only King of England to have ever won the throne, to have lost it, and to have later won the throne a second time. Consequently, his reign is typically organized historically into two periods, his first reign and his second reign. Edward's rule was strengthened after his victory at Towton, but Lancastrian resistance remained a pressing issue for the next three years. The regions of Northumberland and Wales proved to be particularly staunch supporters of Lancaster and difficult to subdue. Edward largely delegated the quelling of these ongoing regional rebellions to his lieutenants, particularly during his first year as king, when he was busy taking the reins of government and management of the kingdom's legal and financial infrastructure in hand. Edward presided over his first parliament in November of 1461, at which his legitimate right to the crown was proclaimed, the Lancastrian line was characterized as one of usurpation, and the increasing degeneracy of the realm was noted. As far as conditions surrounding England's economic and local judicial affairs were concerned, Edward was not exaggerating. Under Henry VI's government, royal revenues had fallen to less than a quarter of what they had been at the end of the previous century. The constant wars with France and the instability of English politics had taken their toll on the 15th century economy in England. Worse still, justice was just as uneven, inefficient and as tainted by corruption as it had been during the Kentish Rebellion a decade before. Edward vowed to take this disastrous situation firmly in hand. To a significant extent, Edward did endeavour to keep these promises. His repeated attendance in the court of the King's Bench was remarkable enough behaviour for a king to be discussed amongst contemporary London commentators. He exhorted the great men, whom he generously gifted with duchies and earldoms, to oversee the equitable and ethical dispensation of justice. But, in reality, local control was almost complete and the king's control of individual regions was tenuous, held together only by the strength of Edward's personality and the loyalty he strove to cultivate through generosity and magnanimity. Edward was also the first king to introduce the methods of privatization to the management of royal lands and finances, although the Tudors, beginning with Henry VII, tend to get most of the credit for this kind of innovation. The fact that Edward IV was never raised or groomed to be king explains much about his approach to royal revenues, which he handled as if they were a privately owned estate. Rather than continue the medieval practice of collecting fixed rents from tenant farmers, 
who were typically allowed to keep any profits, Edward instead hired stewards and receivers to whom he paid wages in order to collect all profits. Further, royal revenues were now paid to the king's personal household account rather than the royal exchequer. Edward was also the first king to invest his own money in various business and finance ventures in much the same manner as any merchant. In this manner, he reduced the likelihood that he would have to rely on parliamentary taxation for funding. And by the middle of his second reign, he had managed to chip away at most of England's debts. Unfortunately, he had also piled up some of his own. Edward understood that he was expected to fit the image of the splendid medieval warrior king. He had displayed impressive bravery and skill on the battlefield, and now he was determined to outshine Henry VI in every other way as well. Edward therefore spent consistently and lavishly on fine clothes, rich jewels, exquisite tapestries, plate and fine furnishings for his palaces. He succeeded in cutting an immensely impressive figure, especially compared to the notably frail, confused and shabby King Henry when his power was at its final ebb. For Edward, it was crucial that both his subjects and foreign dignitaries should see him as the ideal king. He understood that the image of prosperity would make loans far more accessible to the crown and that the valuable assets he was accumulating could serve two purposes, as financial collateral and as a means to impress visitors. The expense that it took to secure such magnificence meant that by the time of his death, Edward left the treasury only marginally better off than he found it. Edward was barely 19 years old when he assumed the throne, and as a young man, he was sometimes more apt to pursue his pleasures than immerse himself in the day-to-day nitty-gritty of governing. Edward was fond of riding, hunting, jousting, and feasting and drinking with his friends. Luckily, His love of the table did not affect him adversely as a young man, since he was highly active and athletic. Edward also kept quite a few mistresses during his reign, although only a few are known by name. Lady Elizabeth Lucy was Edward's mistress for many years, both before and after his marriage, and he had two illegitimate children by her whom he acknowledged, Arthur and Elizabeth. Other well-known mistresses of Edward's include the married Lady Butler, Eleanor Talbot, and Elizabeth Shaw, known more popularly as Jane Shaw. In the first few years of Edward's first reign, when he seemed to want to play rather than work, he had the habit of delegating many political duties to the highest-ranking and most trusted great men in the Yorkist faction, principally Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick. Warwick was highly intelligent, capable, and had been crucial to both the military and propaganda campaigns in the Yorkist cause. Edward had been exceedingly generous to all of his family and supporters, and this was no less true of Warwick. He had rewarded this most important of his lieutenants with the stewardship of the Duchy of Lancaster, the post of Lord High Admiral of England, and many other officers and preferments. For the first few years of Edward's reign, the king was largely approachable only through Warwick. This contributed to the conviction of many contemporary observers and almost certainly Warwick himself that he, rather than Edward, was the real ruler of England. His active involvement in the success of the Yorkist cause and his execution of Edward's policies and administration during the early years had earned him the label the Kingmaker. No doubt, Warwick had been pivotal to Edward's accession to the throne and to the consolidation of Yorkist power during Edward's first reign, but perhaps these facts caused Warwick, as well as some of Edward's biographers and historians, to forget the reality that Edward was not his puppet, but very much his own man, with a mind and a will of his own. Chief among Warwick's early grievances with Edward involved the king's marriage. Warwick had in mind a prestigious royal marriage to a French princess for Edward, and he also favoured a pro-French trade policy which he worked assiduously to cultivate. 
When Edward declined to follow Warwick's advice in these matters, it drove a wedge between them, which steadily worsened during the later 1460s. The first blow came in the summer of 1464, when to forestall any arrangement of a royal marriage, Edward abruptly announced that he had wed Elizabeth Woodville, the widowed Lady Grey, in secret at her family's home some weeks previously. Not only did this inconvenience and embarrass Warwick, who had been negotiating for a French princess on the king's behalf, but it showed that the still youthful 22-year-old Edward was far less pliable than Warwick had believed. The king's marriage was controversial to most of his court. Elizabeth was not only a widow with two young sons, but her late husband had died fighting for the Lancastrians. Her father, Sir Richard Rivers, was not a nobleman, but a common knight who had wed the noble widow of the Duke of Bedford, Jaquetta of Luxembourg. Elizabeth was, critics said distastefully, no fit consort for a king. More troubling to Warwick and other high-ranking Yorkists was the large family that the new queen brought with her. Her numerous siblings and later her many children were soon betrothed in the most prestigious matches that the English nobility could offer, stimulating much jealousy, resentment and concern that there would be far fewer advantageous marriages to be arranged for the children of the Yorkist peerage. Elizabeth and Edward, however, showed every sign of their happiness and obvious love for one another, despite the furore that they had wrought in the court and across the country with their unconventional and socially unequal marriage. Reportedly, Edward was immediately smitten with Elizabeth. In portraits and illustrations, she seemed to have had golden or reddish blonde hair, and one chronicler described her as the most beautiful woman in the island of Britain with lovely, heavy-lidded eyes. The most famous portrait of Elizabeth Woodville, displayed at Queen's College at Cambridge, shows a face with very fine features and what appear to be warm, light brown eyes. The painting is believed to be a copy of one painted from life in 1471, but again, the details of her appearance, like those in Edward's portraiture, might not be quite accurate. Edward, a notorious libertine with women at the best of times, was said to have propositioned Elizabeth very soon after their first meeting, when she had petitioned him for the return of her husband's property following his death. The story goes that Elizabeth had initially refused to submit to Edward's desires, defending her honor quite literally with a knife. Obsessed and unable to forget her, the young king then offered her marriage. What is remarkable about this particular royal marriage is the ease with which Edward could have bedded and discarded Elizabeth. He could easily have denied or repudiated a marriage conducted in secret had he wanted to, especially one so disadvantageous and guaranteed to be opposed by almost everyone. The most reasonable explanation for the fact that he did not was that he loved Elizabeth and had no wish to marry anyone else. Their marriage was a prolific one, producing ten children over fourteen years, eight of whom survived infancy and five of whom survived their adolescence. Nonetheless, Edward continued to take mistresses with regularity even after his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville, which no doubt strained their relationship, but which did not appear to unduly upset the close and happy family life which both Edward and Elizabeth worked to cultivate. Edward's marriage had alienated and inconvenienced Warwick, but he was perhaps made angrier by the king's decision in 1467 to pursue a Burgundian trade policy rather than a French one. To Warwick's dismay, Edward cemented his new alliance with Duke Charles of Burgundy by giving him his sister, Margaret, in marriage. Warwick grew sullen and resentful in the ensuing years and began to look to Edward's younger brother George, Duke of Clarence, as a more promising replacement for the king he could not control. In 1469, Warwick and Clarence began circulating a rumour on the continent that Edward was illegitimate in order to plant the seeds of doubt which might clear George's path to the throne. Against Edward's strict refusals, Warwick and Clarence slipped away to Calais, where Warwick wed his daughter Isabel to George. 
Subsequently, rebellions broke out in the north of England, which some historians consider to have been fermented by Warwick and Clarence, but which could just as easily have been the result of ongoing economic difficulties and local corruption which the conspirators exploited for their own purposes. When they attempted to deal with the northern rebels, Edward's forces were intercepted by Warwick's at Edgecote Moor, where they suffered a terrible defeat. Edward subsequently fell into Warwick's hands, and in the ensuing months, Warwick attempted to force his abdication or, failing that, exercise power in Edward's name. He did not have sufficient support to buttress either his own or Clarence's authority, however, and was soon forced to release his outraged king and cousin. Edward was reportedly deeply shocked and hurt by the betrayal of his brother and his cousin, two people he loved and had trusted implicitly. The years 1469 to 1470 must have been a time of enormous stress and dejection for Edward, who had to confront the mistakes he had made as king, the duplicity of his family, and the grief and rage of his wife, whose father and brother Warwick had executed after the battle at Edgecote. Edward demonstrated his constructive spirit and magnanimity by forgiving Warwick and Clarence, organizing a public reconciliation in Parliament and restoring them to favor. But by 1470, it was clear that Warwick and Clarence had not abandoned their schemes to unsettle Edward's reign when both were implicated in facilitating a rebellion in Lincolnshire. To avoid Edward's wrath, the two fled once again to Calais which shut its doors to Warwick. At this point, Warwick and Clarence were short on both options and supporters, and they had little choice but to throw in their lot with the exiled Lancastrians. The King of France helped organize a reconciliation between Warwick and Margaret of Anjou. Together, they planned an invasion of England and arranged the marriage between Warwick's daughter, Anne Neville, and Margaret's son, Edward of Westminster. Unfortunately, Edward was in Yorkshire dealing with another rebellion when Warwick invaded the capital. Queen Elizabeth and her three young daughters Elizabeth, Mary and Cecily fled into sanctuary at Westminster Abbey and Henry VI was released from the tower where he had been imprisoned since his capture in 1465 and was reinstated as king. The second reign of Henry VI was short and turbulent. The terribly fractious mix of Lancastrians and Yorkists made the imperial centre weak and inefficient. Within less than a year in exile in Holland and Flanders respectively, Edward had gathered sufficient strength to retake England once more. Edward arrived in London in early April of 1471, where he reconciled with his brother, George had been alienated by the plan to reinstate Henry VI, most likely because he saw no profit in it for him. His mother and sisters had assured him in secret communications that if he threw himself on Edward's mercy, he would be welcomed back into the family fold. Edward then marched his men out of London to face Warwick and Margaret of Anjou. On the morning of Easter Sunday, under a near impenetrable fog which he used to his full advantage, Edward's forces defeated Warwick's at the Battle of Barnet. Warwick was killed on the battlefield, and mere days later, Edward's armies confronted those of Margaret of Anjou at Tewkesbury, where, despite their superior numbers, Edward once again prevailed. Margaret's son, Edward of Westminster, was killed in battle, while the Lancastrian queen herself was taken prisoner. Edward re-entered London in triumph on the 21st of May 1471. He went immediately to Westminster to be reunited with his wife and children. There, he discovered that during her time in sanctuary, Queen Elizabeth had given birth to their first son, Prince Edward. The king's happiness was described in a contemporary poem. The king comforted the queen his sweet baby full tenderly he did kiss. The young prince he beheld, and in his arms did bear. Thus his bale turned him to bliss. After sorrow joy the course of the world is. The sight of his baby released part of his woe. Thus the will of God in everything done.
Edward had survived his deposition, fought the final battles of his military career, regained the throne, and thankfully his family had been kept safe. But the ugliness necessary to preserve his power was not yet complete. That very night, King Henry VI was murdered in the Tower. Most historians agree that it was most likely done on Edward's orders by means of a hard and swift blow to the back of the head. While Henry's son, Edward of Westminster, was still alive, there was no point to killing Henry an action which would remove an imprisoned heir and create a new one who was already walking free. Now that his son was dead, Henry could be safely removed. Some historians believe that this dark deed was carried out by Edward's younger brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Intelligent, ambitious, and reputedly ruthless, Richard had remained steadfastly loyal to Edward which makes his later alleged crimes against his nephews, remembered as the princes in the tower, all the more heinous and puzzling. Now, Edward IV was king indeed. His second reign, which lasted for the remaining 12 years of his life, was somewhat more placid than the first, and greater domestic peace allowed him to focus more intently on the reforms he had not fully achieved during his first decade on the throne. Edward continued his work to improve the rule of law, making a point of accompanying officials to oversee the reform and administration of justice, particularly in regions where unrest and rebellion had penetrated. While perhaps no medieval king could have succeeded in entirely banishing the phenomenon of local corruption, England under Edward IV had at least attained a greater stability and institutional efficiency than had ever been the case under Henry VI. Edward also continued to work to make the crown financially solvent once again. In addition to his innovative strategy of privatization of royal lands and finances to increase profits, sometimes Edward's methods of revenue raising were less than honest. The confiscation of Lancastrian lands and assets were par for the course with any regime change and these brought in a great deal of revenue, but the king frequently had to award them to his brothers and supporters to keep them happy. Edward frequently made use of benevolences which were payments to the king to avoid military service. Further, Edward made sure that when the English coinage was revalued during his reign, he raised the minting fees on gold and silver coins, which brought him a handsome profit. The king was also not above petitioning Parliament for funds in order to go to war, but then promptly making peace with his supposed enemies and appropriating the parliamentary grant to swell the royal coffers. This is precisely what he did in 1475, when he undertook an invasion of France. It does not appear, however, that this was his intention from the beginning. Edward was a military man and a great general, and no doubt he was attracted to the idea of victory and martial glory in France, which would ensure his fame and immortality alongside Henry V and Edward III. He spent years cultivating military alliances with Burgundy and Brittany against the French king, and made great efforts to foster peaceful relations with the Scots, so that they would not invade England in France's favour. Yet, by the time Edward finally made it to France, accompanied by all his nobility and their retainers, his allies had deserted him. His subsequent decision to sue for peace was a pragmatic and intelligent decision which secured the best possible outcome Edward could have wanted given the circumstances. No money was wasted in any protracted campaign, and the king, Louis XI, had been so anxious for the English to leave that he agreed to a generous tribute of £15,000 and an additional £10,000 per annum and a marriage between the Dauphin and Edward's eldest daughter, Elizabeth, who would receive a jointure of £60,000, an absurd and unprecedented sum for a royal marriage. Edward's captains and the English people, however, saw it very differently. Many were alienated by Edward's decision not to fight the French and viewed his peace strategy as a sign of cowardice and a cause for shame. The nobility were soon pacified by the economic advantages of the peace from which they benefited, but Edward's broader popularity suffered a significant dip after 1475, 
and he began to gain a reputation for avarice and greed. Still, the results of the French campaign ensured that Edward never again had to petition Parliament for funds, and it ensured that when the king died, he would not leave his heir with a mountain of debts. However, thanks to his own profligate spending, the royal treasury only had about £1,200 in cash upon Edward's death. Worse still, Edward's relationship with his brother George deteriorated significantly in the ensuing years. Edward refused to allow his brother to marry the heiress of Burgundy, as he was still fearful that given the power and the opportunity, his brother might still challenge him for the throne. Resentful, George sought to revive not only the old rumours that Edward was the bastard son of a common archer, but that he had been previously wed in secret prior to his marriage, and therefore all of his children were bastards as well. He was also said to have paid a seer to foretell the king's death. Far from being forgiving this time, Edward presided over George's trial for treason himself, and the Duke of Clarence was executed in the tower on the 18th of February, 1478. Some discussion of Edward's legitimacy is merited here, for it has been a significant source of contention among historians in the last two decades. In 2002, historian Michael K. Jones uncovered evidence which he believed provided conclusive proof that Edward IV was, in fact, illegitimate. The parish records of Rouen Cathedral indicate that roughly nine months before Edward's birth in April 1442, during a crucial five-week period when Edward was likely to have been conceived, Richard, Duke of York, was on campaign in Pontoise. However, this evidence also rests on several assumptions, none of which can be verified for certain. First, Jones assumes that Duchess Cecily remained in Rouen for the entirety of the period, or that Duke Richard did not return at any point during the Pontoise campaign neither of which can be confirmed. Further, we know that Duchess Cecily had just lost her second child, a son named Henry who lived only a few days. Cecily and Richard had departed England for Rouen shortly after the child's death. The Duke and Duchess had grown up together in the same household and while their marriage had been arranged since they were children, their relationship was as close to a love match as an arranged marriage in the medieval period could possibly have been. The notion that Cecily would have had an affair, betraying the husband she ostensibly loved, while still grieving for her dead son, strains credulity somewhat. Even more unlikely is the possibility that the Duchess, who would have been constantly surrounded by servants in her daily life, could have done something so scandalous as to have an affair with a common archer without anyone ever finding out. While the Rouen Cathedral Register is a compelling piece of historical evidence, it is far from conclusive and most historians still continue to accept Edward IV was of legitimate birth. After all, the rumours of Edward's illegitimacy first appeared in 1469 when Warwick was attempting to place George on the throne in Edward's place. In the spring of 1483, Edward became seriously ill. Observers and chroniclers differ on the cause of his illness. One stated that he had caught a chill while fishing on the River Thames, which later developed into a fever. Others claimed he had been poisoned. Yet another claimed that the king had suffered a fit of apoplexy or a stroke. Considering Edward's lifestyle and weight gain in later years, this is probably the most likely scenario. The king lived for only ten more days after the onset of his mysterious illness, but it was long enough to revise his will and arrange for governance and stability during his son's minority. His brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was to be appointed Lord Protector until the 12-year-old Prince Edward came of age. While he was only 40 years old, Edward was lucky enough to die in his bed, with his family and his dearest friends at his bedside assured and comforted that his son would succeed him. These were luxuries afforded few medieval warrior kings.
Some historians assert that Edward's legacy is not as celebrated as it deserves to be. He was undoubtedly one of the greatest generals ever to sit upon the English throne, having never lost a battle at which he had been present. Yet his name is almost never mentioned alongside England's greatest warrior kings, such as Henry V or Edward III. The most likely reason for this is that all of Edward's victories were against his own countrymen rather than against foreigners, and many historians have likely found it difficult to celebrate the abilities of a man whose military genius resulted in the shedding of so much English blood and the destruction of the flower of English chivalry in the mid to late 15th century. Moreover, Edward's legal and financial reforms laid the groundwork for the later Tudor regime, which allowed for greater ease of centralization, facilitating England's journey to eventually becoming Great Britain. Edward was well liked by the English people for much of his reign, which is apparent in the public outpouring of grief and national mourning which followed his death. He was, in many ways, a far more approachable king than the English people had ever had. He was warm, friendly, likeable, forgiving, brave and confident. He was also probably the most English king that the realm had had since the Norman Conquest, a quality that the English people who distrusted most foreigners undoubtedly appreciated. Edward's parents, grandparents and great-grandparents were all born and bred English. Moreover, Edward married an Englishwoman himself rather than a foreign princess, which was almost never the case for English royals. Some historians consider Edward IV to have failed as a king because of the chaos, violence and upheaval which followed his death, with the imprisonment of his sons, the usurpation by his brother Richard, and his subsequent war with Henry Tudor for the throne. However, this perspective fails to take into account that had Edward lived, his children would have dominated the royal marriage market of Europe by marrying into the royal families of France, Spain, Scotland and Denmark, and quite possibly other royal houses as well. Moreover, had Edward IV lived longer, his son would have succeeded to the throne and the Tudor dynasty might never have appeared. Yet, thanks to the clever and skillful negotiations of Elizabeth Woodville with Henry Tudor's mother Margaret Beaufort, the eldest child of Edward IV did in fact succeed to the throne. When Elizabeth of York married Henry Tudor and was crowned Queen of England, she became the progenitor of her father's legacy a long line of kings and queens of England. What do you think of Edward IV? Please let us know in the comments below, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as King Richard III of England was born on the 2nd of October 1452 in Fotheringhay Castle in the county of Northamptonshire. His mother, Cecily Neville, Duchess of York, was the great-granddaughter of King Edward III and was also the mother of two Yorkist kings of England, King Edward IV and King Richard III himself. Richard's father, Richard Plantagenet, 3rd Duke of York, was one of the most renowned and powerful noblemen of his age and was the protector of the realm on various occasions during the reign of the Lancastrian King Henry VI and was also responsible for instigating the Wars of the Roses. Richard was the youngest of the four surviving sons of Cecily and York, which meant that he was unlikely to ever inherit his father's title, let alone claim the throne. But after years of civil war and a series of consequential events, he was eventually crowned and would go on to become one of the most infamous rulers in English history. Young Richard grew up during one of the most famous and bloody conflicts of the medieval era, that being the Wars of the Roses, which was instigated by his father when he was just two years of age 
although the root cause of the conflict can be traced back to much earlier in the Plantagenet dynasty. England had, in the reign of King Edward III, emerged as one of the medieval superpowers of Europe as it had defeated the armies of France in various battles such as Crecy and Poitiers. And so, by the time of Edward III's death, the island nation dominated its continental rival. However, Edward III's son and heir, Edward the Black Prince, who was one of the most renowned and capable commanders in medieval Europe, never got the opportunity to reign as King of England, as he died of dysentery a year before his father in 1376, which meant that the throne then passed to the Black Prince's young son, Richard II, instead. Despite showing promise early on in his reign, Richard II took after his great-grandfather Edward II, much more than his father and grandfather, as he was a weak, tyrannical, and cruel king who eventually alienated his nobles to the very point of rebellion. Consequently, Richard was overthrown by them, imprisoned and starved to death by one of his cousins, Henry of Bolingbroke, who was himself the son of John of Gaunt, Earl of Lancaster, the third son of Edward III, whose earldom was represented by the Red Rose of Lancaster. This act of regicide would in time cause a rift within the Plantagenet family and lead to the Wars of the Roses, as Bolingbroke was not the next in line to the throne after Richard II, and in killing an anointed monarch, Bolingbroke had set a dangerous precedent for the future, and this would eventually place his descendants at odds with the other branches of the Plantagenet family. These rival branches were descended from the second surviving son of Edward III, Lionel of Antwerp, first Duke of Clarence, as well as the fourth surviving son of Edward III, Edmund of Langley, first Duke of York, who represented the House of York under the famous symbol of the White Rose. After the death of King Richard II, Henry Bolingbroke was crowned King Henry IV of England in 1399, and the House of Lancaster then controlled the country for the next 62 years, which also included the reigns of King Henry V and his son, King Henry VI. But the Lancastrian grip over England largely depended on the strength of the reigning monarch and this hold on power then evaporated during the reign of Bolingbroke's grandson, King Henry VI, who, unlike his father, Henry V, had no talent for warfare and was far more interested in the construction of churches and universities than in the maintenance of power. Henry VI's tenuous position was further compounded by him suffering his first mental breakdown in 1453, possibly as a result of his army's final defeat against the French in the Hundred Years' War, resulting a year later in Richard III's father, Richard Duke of York, being made protector of the realm whilst the king was recovering. York was the grandson of Edmund of Langley, the first Duke of York, but his mother, Anne Mortimer, was herself the great-granddaughter of Edward III's second son, the Duke of Clarence, as her grandfather Edmund Mortimer, 3rd Earl of March, had married Clarence's only daughter, Philippa. York's power and influence then increased tenfold when he inherited the Duke of Clarence's claim to the throne through his mother Anne, when her brother, Edmund Mortimer, 5th Earl of March, died with no heirs in 1425, which effectively made him one of the country's richest landowners. This maternal lineage formed the backbone of Richard, Duke of York's claim to the English throne and is the reason for the Wars of the Roses taking place, as although he was a descendant of the fourth son of King Edward III, he was now also the heir of his second son, Lionel of Antwerp, the Duke of Clarence, who had technically been next in line to the throne after Richard II's death. 
York then sought to capitalize on Henry VI's weakness by demanding he be recognized as the rightful heir to the throne, but he inevitably faced opposition from the king's Lancastrian supporters, most notably his wife Queen Margaret of Anjou, who wanted her infant son with Henry, Edward of Westminster, to succeed him as king. Outraged by York's actions, Margaret then formed a powerful coalition against him and with the support of other Lancastrian nobles such as the Duke of Somerset, she pressured the king to remove York from his role as protector of the realm. Henry VI recovered from his illness in December of 1454 and relieved York of his position after which Richard gathered his supporters and marched on London in the hope of a final reckoning with Henry's Lancastrian advisers. The two factions then met on the 22nd of May 1455 in what is regarded as the opening confrontation of the Wars of the Roses, the first Battle of St. Albans in which the Yorks defeated the Lancastrians, the Duke of Somerset was killed, and Henry VI was taken prisoner. After this, York was once again named as protector of the realm, but King Henry, after recovering from another of his stress-related breakdowns, removed him from his position once again, largely at the Queen's behest, which then prompted York to flee the country to Ireland, as he now feared for his life. Whilst York was in Ireland, his ally, Richard Neville, the 16th Earl of Warwick and Constable of Calais used his power base in mainland France to launch raids against trade shipments in the English Channel, but after failing to link up with York in England in 1459, he returned a year later, captured London and defeated the Lancastrians at the Battle of Northampton in July 1460, after which Queen Margaret and her son Edward of Westminster fled to Scotland whilst King Henry was once again taken prisoner. This time, York made it clear that he wanted nothing less than to usurp Henry and become king himself, but he could not obtain the backing of Parliament for such a measure, and instead a compromise was struck in October 1460, which is now known today as the Act of Accord, which stated that Henry VI would retain the throne until his death when it would then pass to York and his heirs. Whilst the Queen was in Scotland rallying support, Lancastrian nobles, including the new Duke of Somerset, who was eager to avenge the death of his father at the First Battle of St. Albans, rallied their forces in the north, which eventually totaled around 15,000 men at arms, and marched south with the aim of defeating York and reinstating Henry VI to the throne. York then marched north himself along with his second son Edmund to confront the Lancastrians. He greatly underestimated the strength of his enemy's forces as his Yorkist host only consisted of around 8,000 men. The two armies then met at the Battle of Wakefield on the 30th of December 1460 in which the Lancastrians were victorious and York and his son were slain. After the victory over York, Queen Margaret returned to England and along with her Lancastrian allies defeated the Earl of Warwick in the Second Battle of St. Albans on the 17th of February 1461 and following the engagement, Henry VI was released from captivity after being found singing under a nearby tree. Following their victory, the Lancastrians progressed to London but were barred from entering the city by its Yorkist supporting populace, which resulted in Margaret making the fatal mistake of retreating to the north to consolidate her support base. The Lancastrian withdrawal then allowed the late York's eldest son, Edward, the new Duke of York, who at 19 was already an experienced commander, to return to London in the following weeks, where he, with the backing of the Earl of Warwick, the church and the city's population, proclaimed himself as King Edward IV of England on the 4th of March, 1461. This escalated the conflict to a whole new level. 
as there were now two kings in England, and with the country now more divided than ever, further hostilities were inevitable and, as a result, both sides now prepared themselves for a final showdown. The young king gathered his supporters and marched towards his family's city of York, which was now being occupied by the Lancastrians, and the two armies then confronted one another on the 29th of March 1461, around 10 miles southwest of York, in the most bloody battle in English history, Towton. The two armies, which consisted of some 30,000 men on both sides, engaged in battle in the midst of a snowstorm and unparalleled slaughter ensued. However, the Yorkists, aided by King Edward's brilliant leadership, were eventually triumphant, and after the carnage had died down, the field was littered with the bodies of some 28,000 men. Whilst the Civil War was raging in England, King Edward's younger brothers, George and Richard, had been staying in the relative safety of the Low Countries. But after their brother's victory at Towton, they returned to the country and took part in Edward's coronation, after which George was given the title of Duke of Clarence and Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Following the Yorkist seizure of power, Clarence, age 12, and Richard, age nine, were placed in the care of the Earl of Warwick in his power base in the Yorkshire Dales, where over the coming years, both brothers were given an education and instructed in the art of warfare until they came of age. Indeed, growing up during the Wars of the Roses helped to shape Richard into the man he would eventually become and as he spent the majority of his teenage years under the tutelage of one of the most capable commanders of his day, in the shape of Warwick, it is no surprise that by the time he reached maturity, he had become a reputable leader in his own right. At the age of 16, Richard began to attend court and began to assume the responsibility of his estates. However, both he and his brother George's loyalty to King Edward would soon be tested, as divisions were starting to form within the House of York and its support base. The reason for this was that Edward, in his handling of the government, had begun to ignore Warwick's advice, and this division between them was then widened to breaking point when it was discovered that King Edward had married a common girl named Elizabeth Woodville in May of 1464. This clandestine marriage ruined Warwick's plans to marry Edward to Anne, the eldest daughter of Louis XI of France, an arrangement which the Earl had brokered in order to secure diplomatic relations between the two kingdoms and, along with it, England's remaining French territories on the continent. Edward's reign thus far had been relatively secure, but his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville elevated both her and her low-born family to dominant positions within the king's court, and they then, over the coming years, worked against the Earl of Warwick and weakened his position. Warwick withdrew from court to his Yorkshire estates in 1467, where he gathered his supporters against the king, including Edward and Richard's brother George, Duke of Clarence, who joined Warwick because Edward had not allowed him to marry the Earl's daughter, and also, as King Edward had no heirs, Clarence hoped to claim the throne for himself, as he was next in line. Warwick and Clarence's rebellion then started in earnest two years later in 1469, when Warwick's rebel army defeated a Loyalist army at the Battle of Edgecote Moor on the 26th of July after which King Edward was taken in custody in Buckinghamshire as the Earl's prisoner. But Warwick's grip over the country did not last for long, as he was unable to secure the backing of the nobility to replace Edward, resulting in him being released shortly afterwards and fearing reprisals, the rebel leaders then fled to the continent in the spring of 1470. While in exile, Warwick and Clarence formed an alliance with the deposed queen, Margaret of Anjou, 
and they then launched a combined invasion of England in September 1470 with the support of the French king, which meant that Edward IV and his brother Richard were forced to flee the country themselves and seek protection in Flanders. Warwick then re-established Henry VI as King of England in what became known as the re adeption which later earned him the nickname of the Kingmaker for his role in restoring the Lancastrians to power, which is a title reserved for few men in the annals of history. Edward VI, who was now under the protection of his brother-in-law the Duke of Burgundy, then returned to England along with the 18-year-old Richard, landing in Yorkist-supporting East Anglia on the 14th of March 1471 with 1,200 men, after which they marched on to York, which threw open its gates to greet them. Both Edward and Richard then progressed south, gathering supporters as they went, one of whom was their brother George, Duke of Clarence, who had been alienated by Warwick after he restored the Lancastrians to power. The Yorkist army then engaged the Earl of Warwick at the Battle of Barnet on the 14th of April 1471, in which Richard, Duke of Gloucester, would come of age. In the battle, which was shrouded in mist, the Lancastrians initially took the upper hand. After their right flank, led by John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, routed the Yorkist left under William Lord Hastings. But even though Edward had lost a sizable portion of his army, both he and his brother Richard did not allow it to crumble, and after Richard led his own attack on Warwick's left, the line was stabilized. Then, in a moment of confusion, Oxford's men who had returned to the fray lost their way in the fog and charged towards their own lines led by Warwick's brother John Neville, who in turn mistook them for Edward's Yorkist reserves and ordered his men to fire a volley of arrows at the approaching cavalry. In the hail of arrows, Oxford's men fled the field crying treachery, after which Edward deployed his reserves to attack the Lancastrian left, culminating in their remaining ranks being decimated and Warwick, the kingmaker, being unable to fend off an attack, was cut down and killed. Richard had played a significant role in the Yorkist victory at Barnet, but almost immediately was presented with another opportunity to display his talent for command against another Lancastrian army less than a month later in the Battle of Tewkesbury on the 4th of May 1471. In the lead up to the battle, King Edward intercepted Margaret of Anjou, who had gathered her remaining support in the West Country and was traveling onwards to Wales to join forces with the Welsh noble Jasper Tudor, brother of Edmund Tudor, the father of Henry Tudor. During the battle, Edward and Clarence's formations were overcome by an attack from Edmund, Duke of Somerset, but were relieved by supporting cavalry, which routed the Lancastrians, after which Richard launched an attack on the Lancastrian center and forced the enemy back until their lines broke and a rout ensued. The victory at Tewkesbury proved to be the decisive battle in securing the crown for Edward IV, as it all but eliminated the major Lancastrian claimants to the throne, including Henry VI's son, Edward of Westminster, the Prince of Wales, who was killed and is the only heir apparent to ever die in battle on English soil. After the battle, Queen Margaret was taken prisoner by the House of York and Richard, along with John Howard, Duke of Norfolk, is said to have put the remaining Lancastrian nobles to death, despite them taking sanctuary in Tewkesbury Abbey. This act of apparent murder was later used by his detractors in the following centuries to portray Richard as a lawless character. But whether the monastery held sanctuary rights at this time has since been contested. Following Tewkesbury, a Lancastrian uprising was led by the late Kingmaker's cousin Thomas Neville, 
which was defeated and afterwards King Henry VI was murdered in the Tower of London on the Vigil of the Ascension between the 21st and 22nd of May 1471, eliminating the final king of the Lancastrian era. Traditionally, Richard has been implicated in the death of Henry, and some say he even sanctioned his death. But this again remains another matter of contention, as there is no way of objectively clarifying who ordered his killing. What is most likely, however, is that the late king died under Edward IV's orders, as he was, after all, the head of state, and only he had the authority to sanction the killing of an anointed monarch. By this stage, the House of York was victorious as it had annihilated its rivals and effectively ended the conflict, after which followed a period of peace, although eventually the storm clouds of treachery and war would descend across England once again and in time lead to the downfall of the Yorkist kings. Following the restoration of Edward IV in June 1461, Richard married Anne Neville, the younger daughter of the late Warwick the Kingmaker, who was also the widow of Edward VI's son, Edward of Westminster, who had died at the Battle of Tewkesbury. This union would see Richard engage in a bitter land dispute with his brother Clarence, who himself married Warwick's elder daughter Isabel, as it is possible that both were trying to gain control of their late father's lands in order to increase their own wealth and power. However, it is also possible that both marriages were born out of love, as both men had known the Neville sisters since their time under their father's tutelage in his power base in Yorkshire during their adolescence. Anne would later be crowned Queen Consort after Richard's rise to power and would go on to give birth to their only son together, Edward of Middleham, Duke of Cornwall, Earl of Chester and Salisbury, and the future Prince of Wales. It was claimed that towards the end of Anne's life, when she lay dying of tuberculosis in March of 1485, that Richard had her poisoned as he intended to marry his brother Edward IV's daughter, Elizabeth of York, but once again, the accuracy of this claim is disputed and may, as with so many of the events of Richard's life, have been twisted for political means. In addition to inheriting land in Wales and Northern England as a result of his marriage to Anne, Richard was also responsible for the administrative body of the Council of the North, and during his tenure he suppressed conflict in the region and brought the Earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland under his influence. This led, over time, to Richard becoming popular with the Northern nobility and its population, as he was responsible, along with his brother King Edward IV, for bringing prosperity and economic opportunities to the region, this he continued to do after he became king by placing his northern lords in positions of power, which proved to be unpopular with some, as he was accused of using them to bolster his position. Despite Richard's chivalrous activities in the north of the country, there are accounts which depict his disposition as malicious and callous, especially surrounding the trial and execution of his brother Clarence. Isabel, Clarence's wife, had died in mysterious circumstances in December 1476, probably from consumption, but Clarence maintained that she had been poisoned by one of her ladies-in-waiting, whom he had executed shortly afterwards. After this, Clarence sought to marry the daughter of Mary, Duchess of Burgundy, but his brother King Edward refused him, prompting Clarence to then leave the king's court in protest which ignited suspicions against him, and shortly afterwards a number of his retainers were arrested, tried, and executed. Clarence then appointed a former Lancastrian supporter, Dr. John Goddard, to protest his retainers' deaths in Parliament, which in turn resulted in Edward having Clarence arrested and put on trial, during which his brother was not allowed to defend himself and after being found guilty, Clarence was executed in the Tower of London 
on the 18th of February, 1478. Richard was portrayed after his own death as greeting his brother's trial with approval, as both he and his wife were named as the principal beneficiaries of Clarence's estates. But there is no concrete evidence to link Richard with Clarence's trial or death, and once again, the responsibility must surely lie with the head of state, Edward IV. It is also claimed that Clarence died upon the instruction or influence of Edward IV's wife Elizabeth Woodville and her family, whose main aim was to ensure that her son, the future Edward V, succeeded his father as Clarence had demonstrated in the past that he posed a threat to the crown and could have become a potential threat to the Prince of Wales in the future. The real story behind Clarence's death may be forever lost to history, but what is known is that at the request of his mother Cecily, Clarence did not face a traditional execution as the evidence of his exhumed remains suggests that he was not beheaded and popular myth states that he was instead drowned in a vat of wine. By the late 1470s, a confrontation was brewing with England's old enemy to the north, the Kingdom of Scotland, and after war was declared in November 1480, Richard, as Warden of the West March, led a successful campaign in the border region and eventually captured the city of Berwick-upon-Tweed in August of 1482 which was the final time the city changed hands between the two rival kingdoms. During this campaign, Richard also occupied Edinburgh for a short period, but was unable to bring the Scottish King James III to battle after he was kidnapped by his own nobles to prevent any possible encounter with the invaders, and afterwards the English were forced to return to Berwick. It is no exaggeration to say that Richard's exploits in Scotland greatly impressed his brother, as well as the English nobility, and he was rewarded with further lands and titles, such as the High Sheriff of Cumberland, and was also permitted to retain many of the lands he appropriated during his Scottish campaign. But then came the event which would change Richard's life, as well as the entire course of English history as, around the time of Easter 1483, Edward IV began to fall ill, until, within a matter of weeks, it was clear that the king was dying. During his final days, the king declared his 12-year-old son Edward as his successor, but also named his brother Richard as Lord Protector until the young king came of age. When King Edward IV died at the age of 40, on the 9th of April 1483, his remains were laid to rest at St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle. Two days after his brother's death, Richard took an oath of loyalty to his nephew, Edward V, but following the death of King Edward, Richard faced opposition amongst the nobility such as the Woodvilles, who had grown into a powerful political force during the reign of the late king. The Woodvilles still maintained a great deal of influence at the time of Edward's passing and were now working to alienate Richard from the process of government, but as the low-born family were hated amongst the established nobility, many of them threw their support behind the Lord Protector, including loyal Yorkist nobles such as William Hastings, first Baron of Hastings, who was the Lord Chamberlain to the old king. Richard saw this withdrawal of support from the Woodvilles as a sign of disrespect, and he responded by assuming responsibility for the young Edward V by seeking to place him under his protection as he was accountable for Edward's safety as Lord Protector. It should be noted also that Richard was not alone in this act, nor was he the instigating party, as it is stated in the Croyland Chronicle written by the Benedictine monk Inguf, that Richard acted upon the instructions of Lord Hastings, who informed him and his ally Henry Stafford, the second Duke of Buckingham, that the Woodvilles were planning on taking control of the country. 
Richard then rode to Northampton on the 29th of April 1483 and intercepted Elizabeth Woodville's brother Anthony Woodville, the second Earl Rivers, who was escorting the young king to London for his coronation, along with a heavily armed 2,000-strong bodyguard. The young king, however, was not present when Richard arrived, as he had been sent south of Northampton to the small town of Stony Stafford before the Lord Protector's arrival, and after dining with Rivers and his entourage, Richard had them arrested, placed a charge of treason against him, and then travelled to intercept the young king before escorting him for his own safety to Bishop Kemp's palace in London, after which he was moved to the royal apartments at the Tower of London, where kings traditionally resided before being crowned. Following his return, the King's Council officially proclaimed Richard as regent to his nephew, and it was also decided that the coronation should be postponed for seven weeks, and then later for three months. After this, on the 13th of June 1483, Richard, along with the Duke of Buckingham, turned on his old ally Baron Hastings during a council meeting at the Tower of London and accused him of plotting against his life with the Woodvilles. It is unclear what happened next, but some accounts state that Hastings, along with a number of his companions, were dragged from the Tower and summarily executed moments later, even though he had been a loyal supporter of Richard in the past. During this period, Richard also attempted to place Earl Rivers on trial for treason, but was barred from doing so by the King's Council. But Rivers was ultimately executed in Richard's stronghold of Pontefract Castle in Yorkshire, one day before he was proclaimed as King on the 25th of June 1483. Upon hearing of the arrest of her brother, the late King Edward IV's wife, Elizabeth Woodville, had sought refuge in Westminster Abbey along with her children, including the nine-year-old Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York. But she then handed over her son to the Archbishop of Canterbury, thinking that he would be safe, assuming that her elder son's coronation was imminent. After this, a clergyman, thought to have been the Bishop of Bath and Wells, is thought to have informed Richard that his brother Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was invalid, as the late king had, before their union, entered into a legal pre-contract to marry the daughter of John Talbot, 1st Earl of Shrewsbury, Lady Eleanor Talbot. Then, on the 22nd of June, 1483, a sermon was held outside the old St. Paul's Cathedral, which stated that both Edward V and the Duke of York were illegitimate, as their parents' marriage was invalid and afterwards a petition was drawn up, which was signed by nobles and commons alike, that asked Richard to assume the throne, which he subsequently agreed to on the 26th of June. Although the marriage between Edward and Elizabeth was declared illegitimate by Richard and his supporters, if sources are accurate, Lady Talbot died in June of 1468, and Edward V was born on the 2nd of November 1470, meaning that he was not born during Lady Talbot's lifetime, and even if the claims of Edward IV's pre-contract are true and valid, he was a widower two years before the birth of his heir. On the other hand, Richard and his supporters would argue that because Edward and Elizabeth had married four years before Lady Talbot's death, any children they had together would have been illegitimate. Indeed, the validity of Richard's accession has always been disputed as the Parliament of 1483 had not yet officially convened. Although, based on a precedent set by Edward in 1461, an informal gathering of officials satisfied legal requirements to declare him king. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was then crowned King Richard III of England at Westminster Abbey on the 6th of July 1483, and his ascendancy was later ratified by an act of parliament called the Titulus Regius in 1484 which deemed him to be the rightful king. This ratification of Richard as king 
has led some to argue that the label placed upon him as a usurper is unwarranted, but as the act was repealed and destroyed when King Henry VII took power, the historical narrative regarding the motivations and legitimacy of Richard's actions are clouded, ambiguous, and open to different interpretations. Among the guests at Richard's coronation were a number of former Lancastrian supporters, including the mother of Henry Tudor, Margaret Beaufort, and her fourth husband, Lord Thomas Stanley, 1st Earl of Derby, who would each eventually play prominent roles in Richard's downfall. During the summer of 1483, Richard secured London and suppressed dissent with the aid of his troops, during which time his men allegedly prevented an attempt to free the princes from the tower, and shortly afterwards, Richard left London and embarked on a tour of England. At this time, rumours started to circulate that the princes, Edward and Richard, had disappeared from the Tower of London, and by the end of the summer of 1483, there were widespread suspicions that the boys were missing or dead. The only concrete fact regarding their disappearance is that they were no longer seen after the summer of 1483, and the story surrounding what happened to them remains a mystery. Although alternative narratives have been suggested as to who may have killed the princes, or even if they were killed at all. It is said that until his death, Richard did not attempt to defend himself regarding the whereabouts of the boys and remained silent on their fate for the rest of his life, which some saw and still see as an admission of his guilt. One of the few accounts of the prince's disappearance comes from an Italian gentleman named Dominic Mancini, who visited England during the summer of 1483. In his report, Mancini insisted that Richard was responsible for the prince's deaths, though his account has been questioned since, as he relied on the testimony of a royal doctor named John Argentine, who was a loyal supporter of Edward IV and later Henry VII. Additionally, Sir Thomas More, a Tudor historian, also claimed that Richard had ordered the princes to be killed and stated that one of his most trusted knights, James Tyrrell, confessed to the murder, stating that the princes were suffocated in their beds by two of Tyrrell's men, Miles Forrest and John Dighton. In contrast to this, others have named Richard's ally Henry Stafford, 2nd Duke of Buckingham, as the man behind the murders, as he himself had a claim to the crown as a descendant of John of Gaunt, and it is proposed that he may have intended to take the crown for himself and was not acting upon Richard's authority. Other theories regarding the prince's disappearance claim that Henry VII himself ordered their murder after coming to power although there is no evidence for this, as, if he had done so, Henry could have produced the bodies as proof that Richard had been responsible. Later historical events also raised fresh doubts over the fate of the princes in the tower when Perkin Warbeck, who claimed to be the younger prince, Richard, Duke of York, staged a coup against Henry VII in the 1490s, but was ultimately imprisoned, admitted to being an imposter, and was then, after a number of escape attempts, hanged in 1499. Once again, the truth behind the boys' deaths is lost in the mists of time, but one possible clue to their fate was discovered during excavations around the Tower of London in 1674 which revealed a small wooden box containing the skeletons of two children. However, these remains have never been formally examined using modern technology as forensic investigations have not yet been authorized to determine if the bones are of the period in question or share any DNA with Richard III's recently discovered remains. What is certain is that the mother of the princes in the tower, Elizabeth Woodville, had just cause to blame Richard and his supporters for the disappearance of her sons, as he, after all, had been charged by her late husband Edward IV to ensure their safety, which, be he innocent of their deaths or not, he failed to do.
This affair, which remains one of the most notorious events in the history of the English monarchy, inevitably forced Elizabeth Woodville into a clandestine alliance with Lady Margaret Beaufort, who was the godmother of one of Elizabeth's daughters, and whose stepson, George Stanley, heir of Lord Thomas Stanley, was married to Elizabeth's sister, Jacquetta's daughter. The Stanleys had originally been one of the earliest supporters of the first Lancastrian king, Henry Bolingbroke, but Thomas, who had since inherited his father's lands and titles in 1459, showed an incredible talent in choosing the winning side in battles, as he had previously refused to commit his troops at the Battle of Blore Heath in September of 1459, even though he had been ordered to by the late Henry VI's wife, Queen Margaret of Anjou. This pragmatism, or disloyalty, eventually resulted in Stanley becoming one of the richest and most powerful noblemen in the land, as he became a supporter of Edward IV during the middle stages of the Wars of the Roses, and his position was then strengthened immeasurably by his marriage to the three times widowed Lady Margaret Beaufort, who had inherited her late father, the Duke of Somerset's lands, as well as those of her previous husbands. Before Lady Margaret had married Thomas Stanley, she had, in her second marriage, been the wife of the Lancastrian supporter Edmund Tudor, first Earl of Richmond, whose father, Owen Tudor, had married King Henry VI's mother, Catherine of Valois, after the death of her first husband, King Henry V. Edmund Tudor had himself been taken prisoner by the House of York in the early stages of the Wars of the Roses, but died of the plague whilst imprisoned, leaving pregnant Margaret widowed at the tender age of 13 in November of 1456, and two months later she then gave birth to her only child, Henry Tudor, the future nemesis of Richard III at Pembroke Castle in Wales. Margaret then started to position her son as a candidate to lead the opposition to Richard III, and even though Henry was hardly a strong candidate in terms of his ancestry, there were few other Lancastrian candidates left alive, and as his mother's husband, Lord Stanley, was one of the most powerful nobles in England, and the Woodvilles were eager to claim revenge on Richard, Henry was the right man in the right place at the right time. Henry Tudor's claim to the English throne derived from his mother, as Lady Margaret was the great-granddaughter of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, third son of Edward III, who had fathered four illegitimate children with his mistress and later wife, Catherine Swinford, one of whom was Margaret's grandfather, John Beaufort. Henry had spent most of his life away from England in exile in Brittany as he had fled the country after King Edward IV's final victory over the House of Lancaster, but despite him now being the most prominent Lancastrian claimant after the deaths of Henry VI and his son, neither Edward IV or Richard III took his claim seriously enough to eliminate him, which would prove to be a fatal mistake. Lady Margaret and Elizabeth then concocted a brilliant plan, which would see Henry Tudor marry Elizabeth Woodville's eldest daughter, Elizabeth of York, and form a union between the houses of Lancaster and York that would potentially attract supporters from both of the competing factions who were disaffected with Richard III's rule. This agreement attracted many of the old King Edward IV's Yorkist supporters who, to say the least, were unhappy with Richard III's ascension to the throne, as well as the disappearance of the princes. And soon after the new king's coronation, in the late summer of 1483, a plot was well underway to depose him. This culminated in Richard III's old ally, the Duke of Buckingham, as well as John Morton and Reginald Bray, raising an army in support of Henry, but after a great storm engulfed the English Channel, Tudor was stranded off the south coast, resulting in the Buckingham Rebellion, as it is now known, fizzling out. 
after which Buckingham himself was captured and executed in November of 1483. After the failed Buckingham Rebellion, Richard sought an agreement with the officials of the Duke of Brittany to hand over Henry to his custody, but after Tudor received word of these plans, he escaped to France, where he gained the backing of his hosts, and in Wren Cathedral on Christmas Day 1483, Henry officially declared his intention to marry Elizabeth Woodville's daughter, Elizabeth of York, after which he stepped up his plans for a second invasion. Although Richard III's reign is, arguably, the most famous of any Plantagenet king, he only sat on the English throne for just over two years, and during this time he held his only parliament in 1484, in which he negotiated the raising of funds in return for abolishing the benevolence levy which kings had used in the past to raise money without Parliament's consent and also agreed to protect English merchants' trade from their foreign competitors. During this time, Richard also extended power to the justices of the peace by granting officials the authority to implement bail measures for detainees and also introduced legal protection for accused citizens, which prevented illegal seizures of property as they awaited trial. Additionally, the king introduced a system of legal representation named the Court of Requests for those who were unable to afford legal costs in which poorer citizens could petition the crown regarding disputes and Richard also oversaw a process by which the laws of the land were translated from the usual Latin or French into English so that commoners were better informed of their rights. It could be said that many of these reforms fly in the face of the picture that has been handed down to us of Richard, as he genuinely seems to have concerned himself with the lives of his subjects. However, the king would never get the chance to prove what kind of king he really was, as the final battle of the Wars of the Roses was now fast approaching. Richard had, after the failed Buckingham Rebellion, confiscated the lands of Elizabeth Woodville, who was still living in England at this time along with those belonging to Henry Tudor's mother, Lady Margaret, as a punishment for their involvement, but handed the latter's lands over to her husband, Lord Stanley, perhaps through fear of him officially joining his wife against Richard, as his support base was now far from secure. In many ways, Lord Stanley was Richard's biggest problem, as his position had been greatly weakened by his perceived involvement in the disappearance of the princes in the Tower, which had, in part, led to the defection of many of his Yorkist supporters during the Buckingham Rebellion, therefore he could not afford to lose the support of any more nobles, let alone one so powerful as Stanley. In the meantime, Henry Tudor's plans of launching a second invasion of England were gathering pace, as he had now gained the backing of the French court, who supported his invasion in order to prevent Richard from interfering with their own planned invasion of the Duchy of Brittany. Tudor was then forced to act quickly and hasten his departure after word reached him that Richard III's wife, Anne Neville, had died in March of 1485 and the king was now planning to marry Elizabeth Woodville's daughter, Elizabeth of York himself, which could have potentially unravel the fragile alliance Henry had with his former Yorkist supporters. Richard III's position had also been greatly weakened in April of 1484 when his son and heir Edward of Middleham, the Prince of Wales, died of unknown causes, which was seen by many as divine retribution for his apparent involvement in the disappearance of the princes in the Tower. Henry Tudor then quickly gathered an army in France with the support of the French King Charles VIII, which totaled as many as 5,000 professional mercenaries and possibly a small contingent of Scottish troops, after which he set sail from Arfleur on the 1st of August 1485 
and landed on the Welsh coast at Milford Haven on the 7th of August, not far from his birthplace at Pembroke Castle. After this, Henry's army progressed through southern and central Wales, gathering supporters as they went, until it finally crossed the English border near Shrewsbury, after which Henry held several secret meetings with his stepfather, Lord Stanley, who had gathered his own forces in the area, and following this, the two separate armies continued their march towards London. Richard had heard of Henry Tudor's landing in Wales on the 11th of August and had since been gathering his supporters throughout the country at his rallying point in the city of Leicester, after which he moved westwards in order to cut off Tudor's advance on London. Richard then learned that Henry Tudor was himself marching towards Leicester as he had supporters in the area he hoped would join him. Therefore, the Yorkist army, which consisted of between 7,500 and 12,000 men, took up a defensive position on a hill roughly 15 miles west of Leicester and awaited their enemy's arrival. Although the Battle of Bosworth Field has for centuries been thought to have taken place just south of Market Bosworth, the actual site of the battle has recently been the subject of debate as the earliest reference to the confrontation taking place at Bosworth was written 25 years after the event, and historians now think the real site of the battle to be nearly two miles southwest of the traditional site. What is known is that on the morning of the 22nd of August 1485, Richard took up a defensive position on a hill to the east of the battlefield, opposite Henry's army, which now numbered in the region of 5,000 to 8,000 men, whilst Lord Stanley took up a separate position to the south of both Henry and Richard's forces. Although the exact details of the day are debated, one version of events is that the initial engagement occurred between the men of Richard's second-in-command John Howard, 1st Duke of Norfolk, on the Yorkist right, and Henry's commander, John de Vere, 13th Earl of Oxford, who commanded the main body of the Lancastrian army. These two contingents, after a short artillery barrage, then engaged one another, whilst Henry looked on to the rear, and after fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the Lancastrians started to gain the upper hand. To counter this, Richard then ordered the commander of his left flank, Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, to attack the Lancastrians. But Percy stood firm, as he perhaps feared his men would be caught in the boggy ground in front of their position, or possibly also feared being attacked in the rear by Lord Stanley's forces to the south. Richard, who was fast running out of options, then made a decision that would change the course of English as well as world history. He saw that Henry and his mounted bodyguard were exposed in front of him and on the spur of the moment ordered a massed cavalry charge in the hope of killing Tudor. The king and his men then thundered down the slope and crashed headlong into Henry's bodyguard. In the onslaught, his standard bearer was killed and Richard came to within feet of his rival. But the charge soon lost its momentum, and Lord Stanley, who had been watching the fighting to the south, ordered his brother William Stanley to attack Richard's flank, and shortly afterwards, the King's men were falling all around him. It is perhaps no surprise that Stanley came to the defense of his stepson Henry, as he, after all, was married to his mother, and as Richard had held his son, George, hostage during the battle, and had even threatened to execute him if he did not receive support, it is possible that Stanley took the opportunity to kill Richard in an act of revenge. The king, who had by this time been unhorsed, then gathered his dwindling troops around him, and supposedly, after being compelled to retreat, cried, God forbid that I retreat one step. I will either win the battle as a king or die as one. <laughs>
Richard's men were then slain one by one around him until he was virtually the last man standing, when, finally, a blow was delivered to his head which floored him, and he was then surrounded and killed by Henry's men. Later examination of King Richard's remains have confirmed that he received nine wounds to his head and no doubt countless more to the soft tissues of his body, and it is a testament to his bravery that after the battle, Henry Tudor's official historian Polydor Virgil said of his death, King Richard alone was killed fighting manfully in the thickest press of his enemies. Henry was then declared king on the battlefield by Lord Stanley, and afterwards Richard's corpse was brought to Leicester naked on horseback to prove that he was in fact dead and that Henry Tudor was triumphant. King Richard III was the last king of England to die on the battlefield when he was killed by the forces of Henry Tudor, who afterwards soon established himself as the supreme ruler of the country and reigned as King Henry VII for just short of a quarter of a century. In 1486, Henry VII fulfilled his promise and married Elizabeth of York, a marriage which was intended to end the royal blood feud between the competing houses as it united the Red Rose of Lancaster with the White Rose of York, which Henry would later merge to form the famous Tudor Rose. For over 500 years, the location of Richard III's body was thought to have been lost, until, in September of 2012, archaeologists announced that the foundations of Greyfriars Church in Leicester had been located and on the 12th of September, remains of an adult male with a curved spine were found under the choir of the old church. Then, after DNA tests were carried out with the help of descendants of Richard III's sister Anne of York, it was then confirmed on the 4th of February 2013 that the body was, in fact, that of the last king of the Plantagenet dynasty and finally, on the 26th of March 2015, Richard III was given a burial fit for a King of England at Leicester Cathedral. Richard III is today regarded as being one of the most famous and notorious kings in English history, as despite him ruling for a relatively short period of time, the dramatic events surrounding his rise to power, as well as his downfall, have ensured his name remains a household word to this very day. In many ways, his life and death exemplifies the cruel and unpredictable nature of power politics of the late medieval era, and his demise marked the end of what many consider to be the most turbulent and bloody conflict in English history. Although Richard has largely been characterized as a villain in the centuries since his death, mainly by his Tudor enemies and their descendants, there have been efforts in recent years to try and ascertain what the truth really is regarding his life and character, and it is fair to say that he was certainly not the pantomime villain he was portrayed to be. Recent developments have also confirmed that he was not the sinister, hunchbacked monarch of Shakespeare's play, but instead suffered from the fairly common complaint that is scoliosis, or curvature of the spine, which in the medieval period many may have seen as a sign of wickedness or evil. Nevertheless, malevolence was something which was attributed to Richard after his death, and is illustrated most in a contemporary painting by an unknown artist which was altered some time after his demise to portray him as having looked sinister and more deformed than he really was. It is certainly true that Richard was a capable ruler and was particularly popular in the north of England, where he is said to have been a just and honorable lord. Therefore, 
It could be said that he was not a tyrant or oppressive in his rule, unlike some of his forebears, but as his reign was so short, there is no certainty as to what kind of king he would have become had he lived. On the other hand, Richard has been accused of many crimes and injustices during his lifetime, most notably the disappearance of the princes in the tower, and despite there being many theories regarding this episode, the most widely accepted version states that they were murdered on Richard's orders or those under him, although, as previously mentioned, there is no concrete evidence to confirm that he was responsible and it is probably a subject that will forever be open to debate. Perhaps a fair assessment would be that Richard was a man of his time, who grew up during one of the most destructive and brutal conflicts in English history, where ruthlessness was essential in order to survive, and as both sides inflicted injustices on one another during the Wars of the Roses, it is perhaps unfair as well as unwise to look at any person involved as being entirely good or entirely bad. What is certain is that the details of King Richard III's life will forever be hotly debated amongst academics and the public at large, as we will probably never know who he really was or what really happened during the penultimate years of the Wars of the Roses. What do you think of Richard III? Was he a sinister villain or the victim of Tudor propaganda? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.